what is up and welcome back to the fast life podcast thank you guys for checking this out again and uh hope you had a great week so far uh, it's thursday and we're ready to drop another podcast for you guys on today's episode we have fish from alleyway customs i met him at my good friend jason hallman's uh wheels of steel show in florida uh, last month in december and uh saw his bike talked with him for a minute and i was eat i was hooked i just like bro like let's do a podcast so uh he flew out here to dallas and uh picked him up took him to the airport or to the studio and we uh we made some some magic happen <laughs> verbally so hope you guys enjoyed this if you don't mind check out my sponsors simpson motorcycle helmets on instagram at simpson motorcycle helmets.com they are my helmet they're stacked in my studio a lot of badass helmets come out of the fast life garage all with that simpson logo on it also check out lexan moto who has an intercom system for you the all new g16 it's a group riders long-awaited answer to an affordable intercom system with a 16 rider comm system bluetooth 5.0 and music sharing it'll keep you and your group connected while traveling together this is another great product from the team at lexan geared at making motorcycle rides and travel more enjoyable Check it out at lexon-moto.com where you can apply the Fast Life offer code which will save you 15%. And as always, you can rest assured that Lexon backs up all their products with the best customer service in the industry. Thundermax has your EFI equipped Harley Davidson covered with their high quality auto tuning ECMs. I've been running their computers on my Road Glide for over 40,000 miles and it continues to give me the optimal performance out of my engine. Paired with their oil cooler fan, which is available for M8 Touring models, my bike has been running strong and at a desirable temperature. You can also check these products out at shoptmax.com and find out which products fit your bike and use offer code FASTLIFE, which will save you 10% off. And follow Thundermax EFI on Instagram. Electric Lighting Co. has your bike covered from headlight to tail light with a ton of LED options for many different Harley Davidson models. All lighting is backed by great warranties and plug and play options, so you can't go wrong with making the switch or stepping up to Electric Lighting Co. NAMM's custom cycle products since 1999 has been offering American made wiring products for all things V Twin, and Badlands for over 30 years has been offering the most reliable and dependable lighting modules in the USA, backed by a lifetime warranty. Find out more about these great companies at namscustomcycleproducts.com and you can drop the FL2021 offer code which gives you free shipping on orders over $100. John Jessup's Team Dream Rides out of Stockton, California and now Tennessee, Ooh, we'll talk about that one soon, is a one-stop shop to have your motorcycle customized, maintained, repaired, and upgraded. id with in-house dyno tuning parts and accessories. Also check out teamdreamrides.com online store to see the full array of products for your bike and you as a rider. And if you're short on cash, you can take advantage of the 100 days same as cash financing on all products at teamdreamrides.com. All you need is a job and a bank account. And while you're at it, give John and the team a follow at dreamridesjohn on Instagram. Paint Huffer metal flake has you covered literally covered with all the badass flakes and pearls you could ever want or need in your paint jobs head on over to paintheffer.com and you can save yourself 10 percent by using the fast life 26 offer code and last but not least you can get some inspiration by checking out all the amazing paint work created with the paint huffer products at paint huffer metal flake on instagram check them all out Whew, another one straight through didn't even have to stop getting good at this i think maybe or maybe i just you know i don't know i read fast <laughs> i'm getting better at it thank you guys for checking this out again like i said fish is a custom painter a custom builder he was a invited or uh he just competed in the uh, people's champ for the 2020 year uh put on by built well for born free and uh, we kind of cover a lot of different things man and this guy's he's lived a couple lives in my opinion this dude's traveled the world uh you know, playing music, skateboarding, bike building, custom painting. I mean, this dude just turns everything he touches into gold, apparently. So, here he is, Fish from Alleyway Customs.
Hey guys, you ready to let the dogs out? Fast Life Podcast. I haven't been recording. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Keep going, but yeah, you have to watch YouTube for the rest. The first uh, <laughs> first 15 minutes. <laughs> Maybe I'll have one of these Montuckies. Oh, that'll get, get that juice flowing, bro. <laughs> All right. We'll see how these go. But no, that's... Cheers. Uh, yeah, cheers, man. Thanks for coming out. No, thank you for having me. But we were talking about skateboarding and... Mm-hmm. Um, not being mechanically inclined, yeah. <laughs> basically, in fact, my two friends, um, Sarge and JT, that got me involved in motorcycles, used to joke. They're like, you know, just give me the wrench. Yeah, like, yeah. It, it will be here forever, you know. And then over the years, I've forced myself to working on stuff to get better at it. And um, but the alley, alleyway comes from the alley uh, that is at my grandparents' property. Mm-hmm. Um, you said the kind of the vibe down there was kind of Venice beachy. You know? uh, it's a surf skate town. Yeah. You know, there's a pier down there. How like I, I've ridden through Jackson. I've ridden across that. One of the long ass bridges that takes you to 10 from Daytona okay. going up. Then you cut over, I think the South side of Jacksonville. Yeah. Haven't been through Jacksonville proper. Yeah. And definitely haven't been to the beach there. So is it compared to like the Daytona and the further South? Is it a little bit different than that? Because it's, it's a lot different where it's, um, it's a beachy town. Okay. And um, eventually people got money um, because the property value went up. But when I was a kid growing up there, we were just kind of getting by in a small, mm-hmm. you know, thousand square foot house. And, you know, everybody lived there because you went to the beach and you went surf fishing and, you know, surfed or skated, you know, yeah. all, all the surf shops around there transitioned into selling skateboards when, that, yeah, you know, that was about when I was in sixth grade, which was uh, 83. Mm-hmm. or so so i started skating in sixth grade and went on till out of high school and a few years past that till life transitioned and yeah i remember uh you know like i i was i i had the weirdest transition right because i went from playing <laughs> basketball right i was fairly decent at it for you know my skin tone and my size <laughs> right and uh i was pretty good at best especially playing street ball so like when i was younger in high school the you remember the and one remember that thing i think so it was yeah, like yeah. a real popular t-shirt thing that was kind of catered to the uh street ball thing right, right right so i did that in high school and then out of nowhere like here i am wearing nike headbands and fucking you know <laughs> wiggered out to be honest with you <laughs> right and then something just hit me and i'm like i want a skateboard I yeah. think it was Tony Hawk Pro Skater that really made me go yeah. like, this game's fun. I bet it's funner to do it. Yeah. And yeah. so I bought a skateboard and then I went down the rabbit hole for like six years. Yeah. But then that was also like junior in high school. I quit playing basketball and started skateboarding. So I yeah. did a 180 basically. And, uh, you know, yeah, it was, it was, it was crazy. Cause you know, then you start fan, like not fantasizing, but like, uh, just idolizing, like, man, like one day I'm gonna get to skate fucking Venice beach or yeah. this. Cause we didn't really have a lot of skate parks here in the late nineties. Right. You know what I mean? It wasn't, well, the, the big, a big thing about, uh, Jacksonville is, is we had Kona mm. and it's, I believe it's the oldest skate park. I in, remember in seeing the things like that in trans world and stuff yeah. like that back in the day. So obviously when you're in sixth grade, you can't drive. There was backyard ramps and vert ramps yeah. and stuff like that, that, you know, being a, a, a kid, that was very intimidating. And we then, always had them here at churches. So you had to go yeah. sit and listen to the oh, bullshit really? for like an hour. And then you're like, all right, now you can go skate the ramp. It's like, well, they were like luring you with like candy and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> or like, <laughs> well, when, um, you know, going to Kona was, was, that was, that was a life changing mm-hmm. thing as a kid, you know, it's, it's a giant place. For a, for a kid, it's fast. You can hurt yourself, you know, and that just having that uh, right out the gate reality check of like, whoa, yeah, this is big leagues. And then, you know, every year they had the summer nationals where all the pros came and skated the vert ramp, mm-hmm. which was terrifying as a kid because, you know, it's, yeah, it's four times taller than you are. And, uh, but, you know, Conan was like, it was like my home. You mm-hmm. know, it was like boys camp. You know, we had a year pass me and my friends and you get dropped off there you'd be there all day yeah and then as i became an adolescent and got a vehicle and then you then you had to hung out in the parking lot and that's where you learned about skate uh, punk rock music and 
you know, <laughs> that's a good point. some yeah. different things some not other. to do from some, <laughs> some older friends that you looked up to and you yeah. start getting influenced and, uh, but yeah, it was, it was a big part of, of us having that there, mm-hmm. you know, and, uh, I'm thankful for, 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 man, that was a big deal. You know, it's, it's weird how like cultural things that kind of move across the country really affect the individual lives. Like say the rockabilly movement coming across the country affecting you or making it to where you can do the band versus also the, the Tony Hawk pro skater, dude, I'm yeah. such a, I'm, I'm so fucking influenced by everything. Cause I, I openly say me too, you know, Tony Hawk made me want to skateboard fast and furious made me want to do car shit. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So it's like it, it, it to me, like those old hot rod magazines in the nineties, I grew up in a body shop. Right. So yeah. that stuff was on every counter you know, probably some weed stem because my dad was a fucking <laughs> pothead, but right. like it was always there and it just never appealed to me. It was always dudes that looked like him that fucked with cars that I know I could never get my hands on. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Same thing with like early, early Harley stuff. Like it was hard for me. To, I didn't have friends in it that could show me that, Oh, you can buy a fucking Dyna for like two grand, bro. Well, that was, you know? that's a different story in itself. The, um, <clears throat> you know, getting into, into Harley's in the time period, that that we did you yeah. know we were in our early 20s what year was this around that was 96 mm. and all i remember Robin that Tupac is died. <laughs> right the only way i remember that is there was a significant record that came out um that i remember i didn't even know how to ride a moped mm. i what you know no motorized equipment in our household as a yeah. kid growing up you know we weren't even we had you know bmx stuff and, and obviously skateboard stuff and all but you know, I went from nothing at all to, hey, my brother's going to loan you four grand to get this 69 yeah. Ironhead. And my buddy Sarge had to te- teach me how to ride it around a Kmart parking lot. And I was scared, Yeah, <laughs> you know. But at that time period, going into the bike shops, it's like, you know, you hear a bunch of stories about, it, listen, uh, you know, of people that went through the same thing. Being that young and at that time period wasn't, they didn't like you. They didn't want yeah. you in there. You know, it was the asshole mentality. So like of, tattoo shops in that same time frame. <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. You know, pretty much, you know. But like my first bike, I'm pretty sure I got taken for about a $1,200 ride on the electric start going out and a generator. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, that bike we chopped up within a year to go full Dave Mann, eight over Springer, eight pangers, sissy bar. See, I, I really wish, man. I really wish that when I was in that my early early years that i would have been influenced by that harley culture that early rather than going down this long road of motorcycle you know sport bikes and other types of bikes before i actually fell into the harley thing you know yeah what I mean? yeah well i remember the first years that we'd go down to daytona to party and hang out so that might be a big thing too is that you had such a huge event well i never knew that there was that many straight exhaust shotgun pipes yeah in the country and I remember just laying in the hotel room, waking up like the next morning, all you hear is just blaring up and down mm-hmm. main street, you know, and like the bug bit, oh, you know, cool, it was, it, there's something about a bike that old, that's that sketchy that, you know, may or may not make it home, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and it just feels way more dangerous. Yeah. You know? I mean, dude, like I was, you, you know, did you ever meet Mark, uh, big trouble? has that gray uh, bag yeah, in Dinah. Because he lives in Jacksonville. Yeah. yeah. So we were talking uh, when I was out in Lakeland, actually. I was like, man, what's it like? Uh, you guys are all from Jacksonville. And at the same time, was basically when Fred Durst was coming out. So how was that? And I know that he was in a tattoo scene, too, or some shit yeah, like that. I know Fred pretty good. <laughs> you do? Yeah. Yeah. It was really I, weird. Well, he, he skated. He did? Okay. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, I don't know why he didn't really skate with, with our crowd of people or mm-hmm. whatever, but then he branched off into doing some other stuff. And um, yeah, I know Fred for a long time, but it was very weird because all that, that Limp Biscuit stuff happened real quick. For real? You know, it, it was like, boom, they were, they were playing. And, and with six other kind of rap metal bands that just happened to not make it yeah. at the same dive bar on the boardwalk where it was metal heads against punk rockers every night fist fighting you know yeah, what i mean yeah. and they just happened to be the punk uh, or the the one that got the ticket basically yeah yeah you know and then it, it was weird but but i mean like those kind of like that that was very influential music for anybody that was probably more my age at the time like mm-hmm. you know 97 98 i was uh you know i graduated in 01 so that's probably you know that music 
I didn't like it at the time because I was a hardcore into rap. I grew up, you know, in the hood of Dallas. So you pretty much didn't get to listen to white music. Right. <laughs> right. You get jumped in high school, man. If you, if you come to school with a Metallica fucking patch on your backpack, dude, you're like, first Problems. off, <laughs> it's not they're going to beat you up right away. They're going to make fun of you for a while. And then as soon as you say anything back to them making fun of you or you make fun of them better, then you get beat up. Yeah. Yeah. Not by one person, but like the group. <laughs> well, what was another side story to all this is that when Fred and all them got money, mm -hmm. see, because I knew some some of the bigger dudes became their security guys mm. when they, they were traveling all over the world with them and stuff. Yeah. You know? So at one of the bike shops that uh, an older guy, Michael Mangani, he had passed away and his son which is younger than, than, than my crew of people. Yeah. He took on, kept the shop going. Well, Fred went and bought a bunch of brand new soft tails from, from the dealership mm -hmm. and had them all customized there. And they lived as a band on the same street I had. I lived on ninth and ninth yeah. in, in Jacksonville beach. And I was building a big, crazy West coast chopper Oh hell yeah! at the time when fat tire stuff was, you know, my first brand new bike that yeah. I, I was always building a bike and riding a bike. <laughs> So I had sold a bike and was actually didn't have one to ride, but that one was almost done, but it was brand new, everything. And I'd go blaring down the street because their bike wasn't as custom as, yeah. <laughs> as the chopper we had going. But it was all good. We're, you know, everybody's still friends. That's cool, man. Like, uh, no matter what, like, it's, it's funny. It's like the joke music, you know, like people might joke about it now. It's like, do you hear one of those fucking songs come on the radio? You're like, fuck, man, this shit goes hard, dude. <laughs> right. Compared to what we got on the radio now, for the most part. So, man, who would have ever thought it is <sighs> like it is now? Dude, I, I bet all the people that hated rap from the 90s and early 2000s wish right. it was like just that still. You know I, what I mean? I don't even, I don't want to get off on a tangent. I don't even know what it, this stuff is. I don't either. I with, just, with the synthesized auto-tune voice it's so weird <laughs> it's super weird but yeah it's a it's i don't know man it's a it's a little bit of a i don't think like when i when i you know sitting here with you you know what i mean like i don't feel old like I, we're talking about this era and i'm right back there you yeah. know what i mean like yeah. i'm right back there like fuck man i remember i remember this girl i was trying to get with her younger brother was all into limp biscuit and i didn't give a shit i was trying to you <laughs> right. know get knuckle deep in this chick you know what i'm saying so, <laughs> right. i didn't you know and i'm thinking about that moment now because that's the first time i ever really heard limp biscuit you know what i mean yeah as crazy as that is yeah i mean you make it that far you're you're gonna leave a mark on some stuff what you, that mean knuckles <laughs> not that many, not your situation okay. knuckle situation yeah <laughs> if that worked both ways <laughs> <laughs> no but you know like it's it's Everything that takes place, all the all the shit that that's taken to cal place in California over the years, it it swipes across the country. And you remember where you were when the first time you heard so and so on the radio, or the first time you opened the magazine and saw that 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 bike that changed your perspective of yeah. motorcycles or that car, or whatever, man. Like there's yeah. it for for a, a world that hates the word brand ambassador and influencer. If we really think about it, like we're we're all subject to that in some form or fashion. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, you know, think about all the iconic bikes that were on. I know with chopper stuff, mm -hmm. like when I met Jason and went down into his shop and that red rum gas tank, tank yeah. was in there. I was like, dude, you got that tank? Dude, he was, he nerded out getting that tank. But I, it was, it was cool seeing him grab a piece of, uh, of his, I don't know. Of the culture that he really, you know, holds the on time to. period, the time a period, big yeah. time period for him, you know, yeah. and, and, my, and myself too. And the crazy thing is that really, it was an iconic bike because it was so simple and it being on the cover, let everyone else know out there like sports or tank stock frame, Springer front end 21, 16, you know, you can yeah. pick the whole bike apart and go, I, I can, I can build I can that bike. That. Yeah. I can build that bike and everybody wanted it. So that's the yeah. other thing about like that whole era, right? Because it made celebrities out of normal guys. Mm -hmm. They were doing exactly what you were doing at the time, wrenching in the garage, doing cool shit. You know what I mean? Like messing a bunch of stuff up. <laughs> hey, do we still do that today? <laughs> right. We just right? get yelped. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, like, that's the thing. It's like, uh, that's what the motorcycle thing did. And I think that's why. I mean, I don't, uh, that's why it blew up so big because it was like an, a, a very easily obtainable uh, celebrity. 
Well, the, you know, that was when all the, uh, the Discovery Channel stuff and all that was going on. You could turn on the TV and, and see all that stuff, you know, when not to sound like, oh, when we did this, whatever yeah. deal. But, you know, back in 96, we were influenced by Easy Rider magazines or a poster or somewhere. There wasn't even yeah. any of the internet forums or any of that stuff. I literally had a panhead idea from just like a poster yeah that that my buddy sarge had on the house in the house we lived in and none of us had a pan head you know what i mean but you knew that was a four over wide glide with some funky tanks and you know drag bars and and that's where you were you know going to get all your influence well at the same time like maybe i'm going off on a fucking uh on a rabbit hole here but maybe that's also why like friendships like you had with these groups and all these guys getting like-minded you guys were forced to actually come out of the house Right. And hang out in a garage and drink a beer and start a band. And, and so like so many more people, I think, were taken like to, you have to go outside the house to be a part of anything. Yeah. When now we have a fucking Google chat for everything. Yeah. <laughs> we have, yeah. you know, an Instagram to show the world what we're doing. So it's like it's much easier to be a hermit now. And I, I don't feel like you get these like team ups of, of people that it's, it's just different. But I don't knock it because, for example. We're talking about pain ideas. Yeah. When you pick me up from the airport, we're talking about doing some leaf work and some scroll work. And I talked about an idea I had in my head and me and you had both seen the bike reference I was thinking about. Yeah. Because it's that, it's all over the place. And, yeah. and for that reason, it's good, you know? But it was a different time period back then to have to create your own, you create your own scene. You create your own group of people. Yeah. You well, know? for sure, the uh, the the being able to see like seeing the bike that you just finished for you know the people's champ deal that is inspiring somebody right now to go like fuck man i'm dream i'm envisioning myself rolling down a1a on that fucking bike right yeah. now yeah. and dude that is the best feeling in the world is when you get that when you get that fucking like uh seeing yourself rolling pch or rolling down monument valley highway whatever the highway is oh, right right just anywhere like down main street and stir just on this bike and you you get that third person like you're playing fucking uh grand theft auto type. Oh, everybody looks over in that in that yeah. window to yeah, see dude. how you're looking that's you know when you get that like that dude i had that when i built my gold bike i mm -hmm. i saw this fucking yeah. dude on Instagram, riding a, a Dyna with a full fairing. It wasn't even an FXR, but it was a right, Dyna. Right, but right. for some reason, that it was the right picture at the right time, and it fucking stuck with me, and I was like, that's what I want to look like going down the road. There's a picture. <laughs> uh, when I finished my panhead, um, I, I built quite a few bikes um, for my closest friend, Mike Wilson. Mm -hmm. And uh, we finished It's a 65 panhead drivetrain in a 48 frame. It was a, bl a blue panhead. It was in... Uh, it was in uh, hot bike, yeah. and uh, you know a, a lot of Mike's bikes sit because he can't decide which one he wants to ride or whatever. That's you know, a good so problem. <laughs> yeah. So I've gotten with him recently to be like, "Hey man, when you come in town, what bike you want to ride? And let's make sure that one's good to go, and we won't worry about why this one has gas in it over here and it sat for six months and the gas is going bad and it needs a flush and blah blah." blah. Anyway, long story short talking about riding bikes and and all that yeah. stuff when i was test riding his bike and really getting it dialed in there's a series of windows in the front of the commercial area mm -hmm. by where the shop's at and there's a danny lyon photo from back in the day and it's a, a club guy going over i think it's the kentucky bridge mm -hmm. and it's a it's a panhead bobber it's a pretty iconic photo it's got stock tanks but chrome uh wassail fenders yeah on it and uh he's you know he's got a pogo seat it's that stance and I always saw that picture. I've been, you know, into panheads now for quite a few years of, of wanting one, of obtaining one, and yeah. trying to maintain a panhead, you know. But that was one of the first styles of panheads that I wanted. So when I was test riding Mike's bike, I came by the window, and it caught that right angle. It's got the same kind of bars. And I looked over, and I was like, man, that's like that Danny Lyon photo. Hell yeah. You know, and it just gave you that feeling just for a split second, like, yep. man, that's what you're in this for, is that little yeah, bit of feels, cool. Yeah, it feels fucking cool as shit, man. Yeah. The, uh, how, that brought me, a, you know, you just said something like, how do you become a panhead guy, a knucklehead guy, or a shovelhead guy? Like, how do you, like, what, what really pushes someone down a specific path that way you know what i mean i became a panhead guy 
honestly because of my friend uh my friends up in atlanta mm -hmm. um i took a trip with them we rode <clears throat> there were so many of us going to the horse smoke out okay one yeah. year when it was still in salisbury mm -hmm. i wouldn't mind checking one of those i always see the pictures from it like that well the, the older ones were really cool yeah um and the one at rockingham motor speedway um is cool i've never rode there my band played there mm. um two times i think that's cool and that's a cool event because they got the drag racing there and yeah. everything um but anyway back to the panhead thing one year we trailered two bikes up to atlanta and there was a pack of us it was eight ten eleven of us mm -hmm. and um a lot of the guys from atlanta used to skate too and i used to skate with them in daytona and different areas like jimmy o'brien mm -hmm. um, my friend shay cannon they're all panhead guys so I got to take that trip with them. And we rode literally with no GPS, no nothing with Jimmy with an Atlas. <laughs> and there, there was a chase Ooh. truck. Yeah. Um, because somebody's old lady was going or something. We had spare tires, cooler full of beer, coils, plug wires, anything that could break. And we just took off and you'd stop whenever, yeah. whatever, and check the Atlas and point in one direction you'd head back up over whatever mountain and and that's when I, I was riding like a bobber style bike that that big fat tire chopper I sold the rolling chassis mm -hmm. and um, put it in a soft tail frame that was like Springer front end Springer bars and just made a real fast 100 cubic inch five speed rideable old style bike but mm -hmm. I was jealous of all the guys riding the old stuff and I've always liked Jimmy's panhead and uh, right Shortly after that trip, I sold that bobber bike mm -hmm. to a guy local in Jack's Beach. And I said, if you want to buy my bike right now, I'll sell it to you for this price. Don't even put the check in my name. There was a 62 pan head in Orlando. Mm. And he handed me the check to that dude's name. And I drove down and got it wow. kind of sight unseen. So I had a 62 pan head for a little while. And, um, you know, the shovel heads... The, the cone shovel heads are more like, they're very similar to an Evo motor. Yeah. You know what I mean? The pan head with it being a generator gear driven, it sounds like an old sewing machine. Mm. And it has that, it's not a horsepower thing. It's this clunky old thing. When it's running smooth, you've done all your work to it. Yeah, yeah. You know, you got nothing rattling and it's just a, it's a different feeling, but that's, that's how I got into pan heads and I, I love them. You know, so I feel like when it comes to all these old bikes, even you know, talking about FXRs, like I don't know so much about the FXR community now because I've heard some horror stories from some close friends about people getting too woke, basically. Right, right. But the thing is, like, when you own an FXR, and I'm just saying that from the experience of it, like, there's a respect that goes around because everybody knows that if you rode it across country, you earned it a little bit, maybe yeah. not as much as you would earn it on a shovel head or any or a a fucking you know pan head or knucklehead but right there's this earn it factor right oh, like yeah. Yeah, it, yeah. it takes a little bit of competence to be able to uh keep these bikes on the road keep them maintained sure. and and you know know what's going on it's not just a button you press all the time so chain maintenance yeah so there's like this level of like i've always thought there was this level of everybody's cool because everybody's dealing with the same shit but i don't know if because fxr has got so popular that people were not trying to generalize, but so, a lot of people were getting into it and getting more on the on the uh, <coughs> excuse me on the fence of I want to be an FXR guy, so I'm going to put my FXR bravado onto everybody else and kind of make FXR community not as fun as it was and not as earned to be here as it was before. Yeah. You know what I mean? All th it it happens to it happens to it. all the all the you different. Know, it happens to all of it, I guess. Yeah. You know, but. Uh, F, FXRs, you're right because, well, you're riding that FXR at a different speed. Yeah, you're 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 cruising. <laughs> yeah, you're you're getting it. You're cruising on a bike with a five speed, unless you, you know, just let's just say a stock FXR yeah. with a you know eighty inch or more motor. Well, you're pushing seventy, seventy five. You're pushing three grand. Yeah, depending on how you got it geared or what you changed around. Mm -hmm. So that bike's. It's not screaming for mercy, but it's, but it's only going to scream like that for so long. So it's yeah. just true what you're saying. And it's a different kind of, I love my 83 FXR and we were talking, I want another one. Yeah. You know, that bike out handles 
all the dinas I rode. It was everything that I heard anybody talk about. Yep. You know, that it, as soon as I sold my FXR and got back on a dyna, I was like, well, there went that. <laughs> there, like I said, there's certain dinas though that I think like, like I said, if I ever get my hands on a, on a T-Sport, I, that'll be one I keep forever. Like yeah. my, I, my garage has always been road glide, T-Sport, full fairing, FXR. As of the last couple of years, 82 FXR deraked by Al Emerson or something right, like right, that. Right, right, um, right. And then, of course, I've always I've always been in love with the chopper, man. It's just like it's I get chopper fever hanging out with a guy like you or something like that for a couple of days. And then then I got to distance myself and get back to reality. You know what I mean? Because like, I want one. I don't have the patience unless you're riding with other chopper people. True. Exactly. You don't you don't panhead people got to go ride with panhead people. Yeah. You know, when I on that particular ride I was talking about, we had 100 inch motors. We were so like, that makes sense with the whole like why you would probably end up falling in love with this because of everybody else is on pan heads and then you've got these great memories. You got the same problems. Yeah. <laughs> you got the same. Yeah, I think I'm fouling my plugs. Oh, I think my whatever my ball and my carburetor's leaking a little bit or, yeah. or whatever. You know what I mean? But you can't have when I had that 62 pan head and I was working with some guys down in Jacksonville beach and they all got bikes. Well, they all got new bikes mm -hmm. we were going riding around and all I had was my 62 and I was taking them in all the corners around the, you know, 35 mile an hour roads and stuff. We get on the highway and I'm like, I'll just meet y'all there. Yeah. I'm not blowing my bike up cause you guys just got a bike, you yeah, know, last exactly. month or whatever, but I built an Evo chopper mm -hmm. and I was like, don't, don't worry. I, I got something <laughs> coming for you. And that Evo chopper, I rode deals gap, Mm -hmm. the dragon all up through the mountains and are you more of a of a rigid frame guy or a swing arm guy or what do you what's i like rigid rigid yeah rigid i yeah. think this if you're gonna do a chopper man it's gonna do be it fucking rigid yeah i mean people do that the crazy frank's rear fender and i, I like yeah. that look you know but i'm kind of i'll catch some hell for this but i'm kind of not into that whole you know a lot of people putting extended front ends on stock frames mm. and i'm not gonna knock them yeah Cause man, you're doing it, and I've I've been there. But yeah. I like a I like a frame to sit pretty level. Go ahead and modify your frame. Yeah, to I get can't that. stand a fucking like monster truck looking front end where man, it's up in the air. You know, I, I I like to ride the bikes, and they're I don't know my experience with the with the bikes up like that. It's kind of sketchy. Yeah, you yeah. know. And if you're keeping it sketchy, that's cool. And again, I ain't gonna knock nobody. You know, but. I always, are you a fan of like when they make these handlebars, they're like so fucking close that their knuckles are looking like they're doing knuckle tattoos. Man, they're, they're, they're great in a straight line, <laughs> you know? Great. Hey, the bike we're doing, uh, I forget what year, Chris's iron heads a 68 mm -hmm. and, uh, we put a 12 over front end on it and to sound like a hypocrite, it is jacked up a little bit because the aftermarket frame that bike was about three inches off the ground mm. you had never cornered it yeah everything with a drug so we we put a bigger front end on it and he likes the he likes the narrow bars and I, that thing runs we're about we're hoping to bring it down to the sarasota show mm. um but i built some stainless bars that are big enough to put grips on you know what i mean <laughs> and they look super cool yeah. but i mean i push that thing around the shop and i'm like oh yeah. <laughs> you know yeah, narrow bars, man. They make it a little bit hard to 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 move things, navigate, and uh, you build you, up your forearms, man. Like as badass as it looks to to ride, you know. Like, <laughs> okay, uh, so like those pictures of fucking Brad Pitt going around yeah. a corner, holding onto the jockey shift, perfect yeah. hair flowing <laughs> in the wind. Wind, not even, uh, not even nope. fucking with his eyes. Like he he's ain't got, got no glasses. No glasses. He's yeah. just fucking sexy as hell going through that shit, man. And uh, it's like you see that, and you're like, like I said, man, like, I'm never gonna be that cool. <laughs> you know what I mean? But you can buy the bike and feel yeah. that cool. You know what I mean? And that's kind of the thing. It's like it's so. I've ridden uh, very shortly. I've ridden a, a jockey shift bike, and God damn, that shit is sketchy to me. Man. But you, it makes you ride a different way than it, I'm exactly. used to riding. So. It's a different mindset. It's a different mindset. And we all put up with it so you can shift by hand, basically, is, is the whole deal. After getting my bike together, I had I built a shovel head out of spare parts that kind of launched my company. Mm -hmm. I sold that bike and uh, way, probably double street value. Yeah. 
and um, did really well on it. And I invested in two other bikes to kind of start building and, and, and rolling with uh, a 69 pan shovel. Mm -hmm. And then I bought a 48 pan head replica. That was my bike. I finished both of those and ended up selling them on down the road. But that shovel head was foot clutch, no front brake, jockey shift. And it was my first one. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I was pretty terrified of it after having one incident. I almost launched myself into some traffic. And, uh, but I wasn't comfortable with it. But getting into, you know, building bikes and doing bikes for everybody, you got to ride them all. Yeah. So I'd have a bunch of customers. You know, with, you had to be able to help steer your customers too, right? Like yeah, with experience. But with people with, hey, I, I am riding a foot clutch bike. I want you to put this foot clutch on. And, you know, it wasn't until recently where I could kind of turn some work down. So, yeah, you know, do, what sure. I, do what I had to yeah. do. And I had to ride them all and test ride them all and make sure they were safe. So I got kind of comfortable with it. But it wasn't until I did the foot clutch on the pan head I just finished. Mm. that so, i've still never i've still never stalled the bike i hate it i don't even it's not wood man you need to not see over there. now i'm gonna stall <laughs> <laughs> so what about uh so you know nowadays if you if you fast forward to now then they see fish <laughs> that's painting fabricating and building you know fucking casting or, or at least designing for casts i don't know if yeah. you actually were doing the castings yet a little bit leather work yeah. like just i mean it, it's where did it start, like, basically getting into where, okay, I'm going to pick up the paint gun and try that? Um, I had painted a little bit of stuff. Um, the There was a, an auto body shop that me and my buddies rented that when I first got yeah. into cars. And there was a guy, it was a, a used car lot. There was a guy, his name was Ron. He worked at the Mayo Clinic uh, during the day delivering organs. Mm -hmm. And he was a hot rodder. But at night for extra money, he'd come to the... Uh, use car a lot and he'd paint bumpers and whatever they had a little makeshift paint booth yeah so he was kind of teaching us you know we only we didn't want to learn we wanted to just get our stuff done mm. i was gonna <laughs> say like what was the what was the drive like was it just necessity well we wanted to build as many cars as we could okay at one time i had probably four 40s 50s and 60s cars mm -hmm. probably a third of them running <laughs> you know but it was we want to learn how to chop cars you know, some of the guys were learning how to do lead work, nice. you know, like we were, we were in, mm -hmm. you know, jump all the way in. And so I had a little bit of paint experience doing that. And then I painted a couple Harleys, did some flame jobs. We were all, you know, first era, we'll get, say of, of the band era was, you know, flames on everything. Oh, yeah. Well, you, you know, mid two thousands. Yeah. So, I mean, you flames was at a pretty good height there. Yeah. You know what I mean? From, from the truck culture that was yeah. going on as well. Like not just mini truck, but just like full size trucks were getting flame jobs left and right. I've literally been pinstriping poorly since then. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, uh, so I had a little bit of, of experience doing the paint stuff, but all the bikes that I was flipping mm -hmm. or not, you know, building one while I was riding one, sell the one I was riding and you got, now you got the new one yeah. to ride. They were all with a, you know, a ton of help from whatever local shop that I didn't know how to wire bikes. I didn't know how to take apart primaries. You know, I didn't know much about motor internals or, or any of that stuff, but I had an idea of this is the kind of bike I want to do. And I was kind of designing them and yeah. doing as much as I could. And then kind of seeking out the help of some other guys, like that guy that played drums that taught me how to fabricate Dave Nissen. Yeah. You know, I go to his shop and be like, Hey, how do we bend some stuff around? And I want to make this and we want to make some handlebars and, you know, stuff like that. So I started off doing leather when, when I quit touring with the band and uh, I was putting together the death machine and I contacted this guy. Um, he goes by Exian leather. His name's Christian baddest leather dude I've ever seen. He did atomic trance bikes. Um, he's still around, but I talked to him on the phone and he was going to do a solo seat, a pee pad, and a side bag. And he was basically saying the same thing that me, you and I were talking about when I was saying, hey, leather yeah. works expensive and stuff. And Mike Wilson had done some leather tooling on a seat that he and I had tried to do together a long time ago. And I was like, well, let me see if I can try mm -hmm. to, you know, another stab at this. So I started out doing the leather stuff. And then when this guy Bubba died 
uh, that was our an old friend of ours that, that was a mechanic in Jacksonville and ran, worked at all the shops. He was a super nice guy. He helped us out with all the mechanical end of all the old bikes. Mm-hmm. So when he passed away, there was a big like lull and we were all still putting whatever project we had together. So some of the older mechanic guys were coming around and trying to get, you know, side hustle a little bit. And I was working with them trying to learn. And the first guy that was working with me, he's, I loved him. He was a good dude, but he was just messed up on pills and stuff. And, you know, we were getting some stuff done, but the first shop that I had that I was supposed to be doing leather out of, he was there working with me and we were getting that shovel head together. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of snowballed into like, Hey man, I want to do this or somebody else. Hey, I want to do this or Hey, I want to get this bike together. So the bikes that I had put together were all missing good paint work, Mm -hmm. good seats, uh, how, how things were fabricated. It was literally all just catalog bot components. Yeah. You know, so I slowly started to transition into like, I want to learn how to do this. I saw this. I want to do this. About that time, there was, you know, internet blogs and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And all, you know, I like a lot of the stuff that the Japanese guys do. Yeah. I mean, choppers even and stuff. today, I mean, they're, they're on another level out there of art. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Big time. So we'd see an idea like that. And that's how it all started to transition. Man, the, uh, the thing with, like sometimes it's kind of rare nowadays to see certain painters that can do everything from airbrush to pinstriping to base coating and graphics. But depending on where you grew up depends on whether or not you had to figure out how to do all that shit to, to make it happen. Yeah. And so it sounds like when you were coming up into this, like you didn't have an option for a C guy or he was so out of your price range that yeah. it made more sense to invest a couple of weeks into learning how to do it. Yeah. You know, and uh, same thing here. It's like, you know, when I was painting, it's like when I was in the good graces of the, the, the biggest painter here in town, I got to paint there and learn every day. Yeah. But when I wasn't in his graces, that means that you're on your own on this Island yeah. where you have no access <laughs> yeah. to any kind of help. And it's like, I'm sure there was like old school pinstripers that ran around town, but even though it would have been helpful to just pay them to come and stripe some flames for me in 06. Yeah. Because they weren't there, I had to do it. Yep. And it's I didn't do a good job, but I had to do it. And yeah. eventually you get here. And yeah. then I'm like, fuck, well, you know, it sucked not having them then, but now I don't need them. Yeah. yeah. So it's uh it's kind of one of those things that like, you know, uh you never realize like how like something that's not going in your favor now can really change how things are working out for you later on. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I wouldn't, you know, I have a shovel head manual Mm -hmm. that the greasiest, dirtiest part of it is the primary section because I didn't know how to do it. And I was, I had a good friend of mine from down in Gainesville, another old mechanic friend Mm -hmm. I knew from working at the shops. He was, his name's Stefan Questel. He, uh, his old Harley. Fancy dude. (laughs) Very fancy. <laughs> Dude. Um, he was Sounds a, suave as fuck. <laughs> he's a good guy, man. Um, he worked on a lot of Harley drag teams yeah. down in Gainesville and stuff. And I was paying him to come up and help me whenever, you know. And uh, it, the long distance thing just didn't work out. And, you know, putting a, putting a primary together, man, if you, I know this now, but, you know, you, you forget a lock tab. Yeah. Whatever. You ain't putting your clutch basket on. Yeah. You ain't, you know, different components, you know. Uh, so I, I, was, I got a couple bikes together and, and I had to figure out the primaries and I wouldn't change that now mm-hmm. because now it's all that, you know, I can look at a twin cam primary and it's all, might not be exactly the same, but it's the same principle. Yeah. And I would have never had that experience if somebody would have continued to hold my hand, you know. So I was making sure the volume was good. <laughs> oh, yeah. Usually people start bitching on YouTube if it's uh, not good. but Yeah. Because I'm seeing the screen. I'm, like, looking at the bars on it and stuff. And I'm like, okay, is that good? Is that good? <laughs> but no, my bad. I'm listening. <laughs> no, no, it's all good. It's all good. No, but it's – uh, so, you know, what's dope is, like, all these things that you did in that late mid-2000s has evolved into what this is now, which is you becoming a, you know – a people's champ guy, which to be honest with you, I'm I'm just going to say it. I think the bike that you built has every, every right to be an invited builder as anybody else I've ever seen there. I mean, obviously there's, there's guys that are building shit that is out of this world that even the best guys in the world can't even touch. Yeah. What was the dude's name that built a fucking see through motor last year? Uh, 
Hawk Lash, the vintage technology. Yeah. Stuff. Yeah. Okay, dude, we're not fucking doing it. Next thing is, dude, this dude's going to come here next year and he's going to fucking pour his own rubber for his tires. Yeah. We just can't, there's nothing we can do about that. Yeah. But everything else I've seen out there, other than a couple of those anomalies, like that guy that, that's just gone above and beyond, like yeah. some guys have actually poured their own castings, like you were saying, right, for the right. motors. Great shit. But just overall aesthetics of looking at a bike, you know, colors, balance, chrome versus paint versus this is handmade. This is designed by me. I did like, come on, man. The popularity contest is what always kills. Like it, it, it kills art is what it kills. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, it's like you're, you're, you're basing this over who has more pull on social media. And it's not really fair to the people that are actually talented that are, putting their nose to the to the ground and grinding or whatever the fucking well, saying is. I, I do want to say um, I, I really, really appreciate Biltwell and the People's Champ for having me be involved in that and Born Free yeah. and all that. Um, you know, the situation got messed up because of COVID. For sure. You know, yeah. um, and that's where it, a lot of things were very frustrating with how it went down, um, you know, and I appreciate everybody digging the bike and, you know, going into that, it is true what you're saying. There is, there's guys pulling off feats of mechanical engineering is like yeah, how I like good, to state it. That's you a know? very fancy way to say the, it. <laughs> the CT Newman's, yeah. the um, Hawk Lash, um, you know, the, the, and it's growing because yeah. the, the bar keeps getting raised and mm -hmm. raised and raised, which became a very, very intimidating thing being in that competition because once you make it to the six, you're going to California. Yeah. And all of that same group of people is going to see your bike on a three or four foot tall platform. And they're going to see underneath your frame. They're mm -hmm. going to see every nut and bolt. And, uh, you know, it was very, very challenging to build something on, I won't say on whatever level, but to try to do it on the very, very highest level that you possibly can. Yeah. And, and by all standards, but my bike is a stock stock uh, rate configuration. It's not a big, crazy looking bike, but all the little details and the different things that, that, you know, you can't just do a round stock sissy bar mm -hmm. because it has to be different than the other guy over there that's using round stock. So what are you going to do different? Yeah. And you I know? mean, realistically, you, you go down the whole different idea. It's like, you're always going to get capped somewhere yeah. that someone else has done. Like you were talking about that with the tank yeah. where it's like, you know what? I want to do something different. I'm not saying it hasn't been done with the tank that you did. Like you, you sure, your words. Sure. It's like it, it has been done. It just hasn't been overdone. It, yeah. yeah. Well, the reason why I picked that tank is because there wasn't many other options as, other than building your own shape. Yeah. But you know, any kind of wassail tank configuration in a Frisco or mid tunnel, that was the last three years. If you're paying attention, Oh, okay. you know what I mean? Yeah. I could have very easily, I had a wassail mocked up on it. You know, I had a sprung bait seat on it and was terrified about not putting a sprung bait seat on that bike because that was, that's what looks so natural. Yeah. That's what you're expecting to see. And how would my style seat go over? Mm -hmm. And the other crazy thing that I didn't realize, but in designing that bike, having had the bike down to Jason's show in Lakeland and you know, that it's going to be a couple different places for stuff we're doing. I built that bike specifically for the era and style that is at Born Free. Yeah. That's it, why there's I can see that. That's yeah. why there's no heavy flake. That's why it's that bike in my opinion is my take on a late 50s early 60s style bobber chopper. Mm -hmm. Nothing was cut. They weren't doing longer front ends. It was sissy bar, kind of the bars that came from the race style, yeah. you know, because those are Stellings and Hellings bars that Tom Faber did. Mm -hmm. And and to make a bike like that look like, for the most part, you wouldn't, it fit. Have, you wouldn't have seen that bike after 66, you know. It was a panhead motor from 51, you know. It was kind of like you could have done. Maybe the paint was a little bit more modern than could have been done back in that day. but So that's why I never really got... I never jived with that, you know, because obviously you said you listen to podcasts. I hate Chopper Flames. Yeah. I feel like I get that, that like, you know, Scott Chemical Candy, I love the dude. Yeah. But I just can't get over the, the seaweed flames. And it's like when you're starting to do these things that are period correct, 
it, it's it's weird because I love I love Born Free. I yep. love the culture that yeah. it's created. I love all the things that Born Free helped inspire across the country from the congregation to Giddy yeah. Up yeah, yeah. to Mama Try to all mm-hmm. these other things. Sure. I love it. But as a traditional complainer, <laughs> a professional complainer, <laughs> all right. there's always something I like to complain about. And when it comes to customization, you know, it's like I've always questioned this with the chopper scene is like, is everybody so bent out of shape trying to create something that's already been done that we're not going to have an identity for 2010 to 2020? It just keeps getting crazier. You, you know what I mean? With the 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 prestige of you know, I want a big twin flathead motor. Mm-hmm. I hope I can obtain one before it becomes the new knucklehead motor. Because mm-hmm. a lot of people have been like, ah, I don't want a big twin flathead motor. I want one bad. Those are, they made a lot of those because those were the war bikes, right? Yeah, and I don't know a lot as much about them as, and I'm not going to say I'm an expert on 45s other than um, flathead 45s other than I have one. I did Mike's 45 yeah. too, you know. But um, it's the big twin flatheads, the next oddball big twin. Mm-hmm. You know, the knucklehead, you better sell everything you got to get one, which I ain't saying if one didn't plop in my lap, I'm not trying to sound like I'm bashing on it, but yeah. it's an, it's an expensive motorcycle I have sitting there, you know, and really any of these motorcycles, if you're going to be, in my opinion, competitive or uh, for whatever purpose you might be showing your bike at Born Free or Congregation or Mama Tried, you better have at least a pan shovel motor. Yeah. You know what I mean? So on a minimum, you're looking at 10, 12 grand in parts yeah maybe depending on where you get all your parts from would you start and getting into See, a, that's, that's what i hate about it though that like to me that's i'm not trying to i get this because while i'm getting this in the performance back world i'm i want it, the narrative to be this i want a pangers to be accepted on this type of bike and you're saying that these bikes for this born free style bills needs to be like you know it, or this Kinda. I don't want to. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but basically, like there's a there's a style or there's a cap on the years where it becomes a little bit not. Well, I mean that that's just from uh, what whoever has deemed acceptable. Yeah, you know. Yeah. But but that's you know a, that's where I believe you get the nostalgia motors from. Okay, you know what sense. I mean. Yeah. that's the that's the era of the bikes that you know that are cool. They're hard you know? to find. They're harder to find. You know, cone, and cone shovels are pretty abundant. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, 70s, you know? I mean, they ramped up production in that era. So Plus all of those, um, except, I mean, except for the pan shovel mm-hmm. motor stuff, that there's still a lot of that was a um, the rigid frame years, mm. you know? So when you're looking at a bike that somebody put together in the 60s or 50s, there wasn't no swing arm yeah. stuff. So the chopper platform... You know, was, uh, right there already. Right there. It, you didn't it, have to hard tell it. <laughs> it. It literally, you know, somebody was joking that I was talking to recently about how many different ways you can change around a 21 inch front wheel, 16 or 18 inch rear wheel, and a rigid frame, and how many different looks you can ha- make that bike have. Yeah. You know, sissy bar, no sissy bar, tall bar, short bars, you know, Sportster tank, Frisco tank. Wassel tank, any of those tanks in a Frisco or lowered, you know, you can change it all around and make, you know, that's what's fun about all this stuff is that you can change. If you're not building show bikes and you're just doing rider bikes, you change your bike up every year. Yeah. Throw a different tank, different tank on it, different style. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I get that, man. Um, I I don't know. I just like the idea of like, I don't know. It, I don't want to be a hypocrite saying it because I, it's going to hurt me for my performance bag or fucking <laughs> uh, stickler. Like, oh, you're not welcome. Um, but no, I do. Uh, I, I see that. But I, I love the way Born Free is, man. Like one thing I was going to bring up is that a lot of people are bitching about getting their money back from tickets and vendor spaces. And I get all that stuff. Man, I feel for them guys that are putting it on. <laughs> I feel for the guy. That's what I wanted to say. It's like. I, I've, I've asked this question before. If everybody was, if, if a if an Instagram thing popped up and said, "Hey guys, guess what? If you guys all don't put a dollar or twenty dollars on the table right now, every magazine's going to be gone next year, right?" I think more people would have been like, "All right, man, here's twenty bucks, man. I want I, I want to be able to still get magazines." Yeah. Yeah. So unfortunately, this COVID thing hit us all pretty hard. Uh, others worse than others, whatever the fuck you want to say. Obviously, everything out in California got hit pretty hard based on their governing situations and stuff like that. So right. I want Born Free to be there. 
So if if I'm saying this as someone that has no no money in the pot, so <laughs> right, it's kind of right. unfair. But uh, I do, you know, I feel like if it's a if it's a forty dollar loss that you got on this deal, man, just chalk it up to motorcycles. You if, know, what if I mean? you're truly a motorcycle enthusiast, yeah. and, and can appreciate what I don't know, uh, Still, I don't know those guys personally, mm-hmm. but just from the stuff that happened with the People's Champ thing and the changes that happened when COVID hit through the middle of it, you know. Um, you're trying to be professional. You're, yeah. give, you're given an opportunity to to raise your career if you choose to do that with the competition, and you're expected to act professionally. So you have to be very understanding about what is going on internally, what's going on with why Biltwell's involved in that, what's yeah. going on with everything it takes to put on. And you know, no one ever shared the specifics with us about what it takes to put on an event like Born Free. But people chimed it's in here lot. and there. Yeah. And, and you realize that it's an, an enormous undertaking to do what they have done. And for so long, man, and hats off to them. You know what I mean? But it, it would be nice if some people could be a little more understanding because we all want to see it happen again. Yeah, I mean, like that it's Born Free is like our modern day birthing of Sturgis. You know what I mean? Like yeah. who knows what it's going to be in 20 years, but obviously like the politics are always going to be there. I mean, we lost Giddy up to some bike club drama. Right. For the most part. You know what I mean? Right. Fortunately, I don't think that's going to happen uh, with, um, with born free. I think they're a little bit more on the professional side of things. Yeah. But um, man, it's uh, we need those kind of shows to kind of uh, inspire people to want to do this shit. Cause not everybody's going to, I was telling I was I was giving you my my spill on Sturgis, man. I was telling you like, oh man, Sturgis is everything. Right. If it was, if I just got into bikes, maybe it would be everything for me. Maybe I don't understand it yet, right? But right. I need a thing like Born Free to teach me what's cool about bikes before I go to a place like Sturgis, where you're getting so many things. Like it's like Sturgis is like walking down the strip in in Vegas, and everybody you got someone clicking cards for right, like right. escorts. You got somebody. <laughs> taking pictures with you you don't know how this situation works you don't know the transactions yeah <laughs> there's yeah, just so yeah. much going on so like at least if you go to born free you go to giddy up you go to mama tried you know these smaller more uh you know intimate type of shows for the sense yeah um then you get to understand these bigger events like 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 sturgis and, and you, you know you're, it's like everybody's there it's like a walmart for motorcyclists right but it's a good time <laughs> born free um you know they set the standard yeah the, their event inevitably built the standard of what you know the baddest bikes in the in the country in the in the vintage and chopper world yeah you know what i mean it, it aside from moon eyes yokohama in my opinion yeah it's it's the the top tier of motorcycle shows and and what um, about what about like all the aspects of like because you you seem to have come up in the same era that like brian from tpj came up you know that early 2000s inspired mm-hmm. by the west coast chopper building your bikes and then you you know you have your 10 years basically putting into this thing before you start to come into your own yeah for the most part right so it's like you know even though brian doesn't build vintage choppers but he still builds his version of a chopper sure why hasn't that ever evolved into a born free type place you know what i mean with a more modern chopper well just building a bike in general i mean it's still a chopper i mean uh i mean i i mean his bikes are kind of all over the place not not in a bad way like Mm -hmm. he'll build something more traditional chopper the next thing you know he's got this fucking this ripper sportster i mean he lives in a fucking mountain right so you know he's, he's his riding is different but I just wondered why, like, Born Free or that world of choppers never opened the doors to anything other than just vin- vintage. Um, well, but, that's that's part of the, you know, in my opinion, the, uh, the hot rod and, and motorcycle culture was so strong in Southern mm-hmm. California without me being a person that ever lived there and, yeah. and dug through vintage parts with, with the guys and all. I just know it from an East, Co- East Coast standpoint of uh, – you know, you when you can go up the street mm-hmm. and find a building and some dude that knew your uncle or something, and it's got the baddest parts that everybody yeah. in the country is looking for, and you can buy it for whatever said price, you know, that's way cheaper than someone from a different part of the country can can, can buy it from, you know. Uh, that's got to fuel some things. It's it's all more readily available, mm-hmm. you know. And then there's all the culture of it, yeah. Of, culture, yeah. Y- you know, where 
where it, where it all stemmed from. So I think it's all, all the, you know, the, the history and stuff coming from there, but that, you know, I don't know. There's a lot of, I, if, you're, I, if you're in the know, you, you yeah, get, you get I, all I'm, the good stuff. Like I said, I, I say that because in a part of my body feels like, oh man, like you guys should know about these other badass, talented fabricators, machinists, builders, all this stuff like this. But then I fall back into that same category that I am with performance baggers and ape hangers. It's like, well, you do have a badass bike, but you just, it's not a vintage bike. So sorry. Man, the way you I know? figure it is as long as you're into motorcycles. Yeah, it is cool. It's but all it, good. There's just like, what, what it is is this. It, it's so, to me, like I'm, I'm kind of buzzing a little bit. It's kind of weird. Don't we these, enter, these monster drinks are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of buzzing, but no, it's uh it's kind of weird how the they're similar because vintage choppers it's like when you say the word chopper, you think for for someone that doesn't know the difference, you think West Coast choppers, you think fucking uh, OCC, you think of every crazy TV show chopper thing that was made right. in the in, you know 20, fifteen years ago, and you're like, oh okay, but you're like, N -n -n not those choppers, you know, original, you know, find it in a barn, yeah. make them nice or make them original, make them period correct kind of bikes. So it's like a different world, even though the word chopper kind of encapsulates the whole spectrum. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, it, it's a lot of different people's uh, takes on, on stuff and, uh, and a lot of uh, evolution yeah. of technology and, and, you know, a bunch of people getting sick of uh, breaking down everywhere they go, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, you know, throwing an Evo motor in a rigid frame and still have the same style configuration and, you know, you can go put thousands and thousands and thousands of miles on that Evo motor. Yeah. Riding at the speed of the rest of the old bikes, <laughs> you know, it'll last forever. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, man. I, I, I think what it, it's good that there's differences, but it should, what it should have done is it should have inspired other people that are into other things to create events along the lines of the style of bike that they build that has the same aspects of a born free or a mama tried. You know what I mean? Yeah. Instead of like, why won't you guys let me play with you? Right. Yeah. Which, like well, I said, I'm not trying to be a hypocrite, even though exactly what I just said contradicts it. But yeah, you know. I mean, I don't know. That's cool. That you guys are super cool and I want to be cool, but I don't want to do what you're doing. <laughs> and, and your bike's a dork bike because it's a 90s motor. Dude, man. How many dudes get butthurt because I said that they're ape hangers or not performance baggers? <laughs> do you know how stupid that's? I feel like. I feel like I have a fort in my house and I'm not letting one of my younger brothers come in because they're not my age. Like it's just a, it's a stupid thing that blocks people out, but it's like, man, like if I let you in, then everybody gets to be this and it waters down. What, what is this cool thing well, we're doing? Yeah. You know, and then there's, there's a part of that, that you want to, man, you want to have like-minded, exactly. not, not to be an elitist about some things but you want to have other people that are riding a road glide next to you have the proper gear on it yeah for what you like doing and mm -hmm. to have that same conversation and not kind of an off conversation with well, i don't really understand why you put those parts on your bike but you're a nice guy yeah uh, it's you weird. know it, it's <laughs> a, a weird good point, it's a it's weird a, thing you, you know yeah i don't know so with paint and everything i mean you've been diving deeper down the paint like you were saying on J on uh, jason's podcast you're talking like there is money in paint, obviously. And there, yeah. you know, you guys had a nice conversation going back and forth between, you know, Jason's more of a builder that subs out paint. You're a builder, but also you do paint. So you kind of get a little bit of both worlds and he has both worlds, but with a different perspective into the paint world. Yeah. Um, alleyways structured right now is, um, you know, locally uh, until, uh, what will hopefully happen in the future is we'll start sending a little bit more paint in and out of town mm -hmm. and working with some different people. There's already some stuff in the works with that. Um, but there's, there's good money uh, in Jacksonville with, with paint. There's, yeah. there's not really great money. Most of the bikes that I build are for uh, famous tattoo artists all over the country. That's cool. You know, yeah. um, that are through some of my connections between Mike Wilson and other people that I've met and known for 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're, they're thinking the same way I'm thinking. They have a realistic budget. You know, um, it, there's it's tough to do that with, uh, and I'm sympathetic. I was there uh, yeah. with unrealistic budgets and stuff like that, you know. So we do a handful, you like six bikes a year, 
you know, like right now, um, on the, on the, on the plate is, uh, an XR 1000 restoration. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a, what's the other one? A, a road King, like a Cholo style road King, you know, that I don't mind doing for a guy. It's nice. I, I don't mind doing bikes that are rideable. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, I mean, not to pinpoint one way or the other, but if it's rideable, I can stand behind it to a certain extent, you know, and, and a lot of repeat customers and stuff like that, you know, but we're doing some twin cam chopper frames. Um, I you know, them. um, I, I just built a frame for a guy that uh, helped out a bunch with all the casting work on the pan head and it's a zero engineering stance twin cam chopper frame. So I took his soft tail frame to save the title and the VIN numbers yeah. and just built off the cradle and he had a specific, I built the, the hard tail section. So it comes at a nice arch from the axle all the way to the neck mm. and built it specifically with his tire and rim size and all that stuff. So we're doing that one. And, um, Brian Buteris just built us a frame for, uh, Chris Rosenberg that works at the shop. Mm. Uh, he's doing a chopper and we got, uh, one of bare knuckle Paul's narrow 49 millimeter front ends we're putting on it. Mm. And, uh, dude, his, his, I think his knuckle, right? Oh my God. That's a beautiful bike. God damn, dude. I sat on that thing and I immediately felt like, I was like, dude, I can get laid on this bike. <laughs> right. It is a beautiful it's bike. It's so nice. I was so bummed that it wasn't at Lakeland. I was like, oh man, am I going to get to see that bike? It's nice, dude. Yeah. I took a couple of pictures of it when I was out there. It's, uh, it's, it's that Midwest style, man, yeah. which I'm, you know, yeah. I like to say we're in Midwest. We're, we're kind of fucked here in Dallas. Man, you're one of the first people that I've been in Dallas in the, that gave me a history lesson on it. So I kind of understand a little bit more now. I was happy about that because yeah. most of the other people are like, yeah, we're in Dallas. I, I don't know why we're here. I'm just visiting too. Dude, I think that over the last couple of years, Dallas is like came into its own. You know what I mean? Like we've just now, we've always had cool areas, but now I think people are, I don't know if we're like ignorantly proud of it. <laughs> Yeah. Or if we're just like, yo, man, it's fuck. We have a good time here, dude. Like, I've always liked Texas. It, so, it's got a lot of cool elements, you know, semi independent state, right? But Texas is so big, right? So it's yeah. like, obviously, if you, if you talk about El Paso, you're talking about Southwest, right? El Paso is more Phoenix than it is Dallas. Yeah. Or any other part. Yeah. Dallas is more, in my opinion, like a part of that Midwest kind of vibe mm -hmm. than Houston's more South. Yeah. Austin's kind of its own thing. It's kind of like if everybody just came in the middle to meet there and create a unified part of yeah. Texas, it's yeah. like all the, it's basically it's what it like, is. It's like Asheville, North yeah. Carolina yeah, and, and different, different towns like that that are, yeah, I like it cause it's art based. Yeah, for sure. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of art all around, you know, being in. I love art, but then when, when people like, I've never been able to get my, I've never been able to wrap my head around the uh, hand built show. You, you ever been to that or seen it? Bike it, show? Yeah, hand-built show. I've it's, heard of it. I, I didn't know it was in Austin. It's yeah, in it's, Austin? It's, really? it's in Austin. It's, uh, it's, I don't, I don't like it. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like, it doesn't, I don't know. It's like, uh, I don't, I, I hate to say it because I personally don't like it for no yeah. real, uh, solid evidence. Kind of like sometimes you meet a guy, I don't like that fucking dude. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. It's like that simple. I just, I don't dig it. It's I'm not, not in a position to disclose any of that. Jake. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, I'm not, I'm just not a huge fan of it. Like it doesn't give me like when I, I've been to it twice and it's like when I walked away from it, I wasn't like inspired. I wasn't, yeah. Uh, I wasn't like that was worth it. Uh, right. you know, like right. nothing. I was like, you know what? It was kind of lame, but that one bike, it wasn't even one bike in there. I don't know a lot about it. I, yeah. I, it's got a cool name. Yeah. You know? I mean, dude, it, it's, it's just super trendy. Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like the people that are in the show are talented sure. as ever. Sure. I mean, it, as can be like, they're very talented builders. I just don't think that the, uh, the show does a good job of uh, creating a well-rounded event that, that really showcases the art of building the bikes and it's, maybe it's the selection of bikes and I'm more mm -hmm. of a V-twin Harley guy and there's right. like, you walk in and there might be a Harley and then there's a... Oh, they do other makes and stuff. Yeah. Right and oh, so right. like, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to know what they did differently on this, you know, XS 750 or 600, sure. wherever the fuck the old Hondas sure. are or whatever. Or is that Yamaha? I don't remember. Whatever yeah. it is, just I, like these old metric bikes. Like, I don't really know what they... Obviously, it's not like that from the factory, but I can't... 
admire what it was to where it is now. I'm the same way. I'm not well rounded in all of the other. Yeah. I'm a hard. So, guy, like I know? said, not to not to bast or show. It's my either ignorance to the bikes or just my lack of knowing what well, I'm looking at. All sh- all shows have a certain vibe. You know what I mean. Yeah. The congregation show is is one of my favorites. I want to go, man. Man, it's uh, them dudes. It's very prism, Im- right? Yeah, yeah, it's very impressive how well organized that show is. I heard and it was like in a really cool old building that was like a... The, the old building was a Model A factory. Model A factory, that's right. Then in World War II era... Came a bomb. Uh, hopefully, hopefully I got my story straight, but this is a story that, that I heard and, and roll with. Um, it became a bomb factory. So all those pictures that you see, or it looks like tile floor, those are three by six or eight pieces of wood that are three foot deep into the ground to keep tools from dropping and sparking and blowing the place up. Mm. But the cool thing about the congregation show is not as not only is it run very professionally, but they select a bunch of, a bunch of bikes and it's all vintage stuff. Their vintage car selection that they have people participate Mm -hmm. in is old race thirties cars, Mercury's, um, you know, and it's just, they're spaced out really good. Yeah. So that you can take a picture of them. You can walk around them really well. You know, um, they do a really good job of dressing the inside of the building up and, and they treat everybody really good. It's got a really good vibe. That's something me and you talked about. That That's exactly one thing that's really important about, uh, you know, these shows is right. It, it's like you, you, you want to have it to where it's very photographic, where it's very shareable. Yeah, right. You know right. what I mean? So that every time someone, you know, like if the first time I actually got to see, you know, the Folsom bike that you built, mm-hmm. the first time I get to see it is at Lakeland show. You know what I mean? Like not to shit on Jason. I love him, <laughs> but right, like right. the blue carpet doesn't really do well with the, the bike. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's yeah. like, you you seeing that in like an old bomb factory now like mm-hmm. that all of a sudden everybody's cell phone picture is like it some accident- model shit. It, you know it accidentally I mean? works out super super. Yeah, and, and it's is it accidental though? Well, probably. You know not. what I mean? Like <laughs> probably not. It's just it's just like <laughs> very me. minute things that that I think that doesn't get thought about that I didn't think about until I've experienced the the very trendy place like uh, like i said oliver peck did the uh the southern throwdown which was yeah he would do it in the bomb factory and the bomb factory is more like a concert venue Mm -hmm. but still the concert venue has a vibe to it it's got wood shiny floors or not wood shiny uh like polished concrete floors the lighting yeah everything becomes like every shot that someone takes with their phone becomes like potential advertisements for the show they had a show in england i can't remember what the name of it was chopper shell mm-hmm. that's in some it looks like it i think it's in an underground subway or something oh, like fuck that yeah, dude. and and it get you a little adidas jumpsuit <laughs> right. come in there with a chain and just look you know dude, right. just go in there full yeah yeah man but uh yeah the congregation show is a good one for sure well and, i think uh, that the chopper community the vintage chopper mainly is they've always had their their thumb on the pulse of like art from the photography side to the mm-hmm. t-shirt designing the bikes and all yeah. the other handcrafted things that, that come into play with choppers i mean yeah. from the the tool leather to the uh the casting to the uh you know the handmade parts welding painting yeah. photography like yeah. it all goes into play so like when you put a show together that kind of shows all that shit off very well then you know like i said it becomes like this thing that's so shareable on social media and it blows yeah. up. You know, you look at Chop Colt and it's got hundreds of thousands of followers because they share all these badass pictures. Yeah. These badass pictures come from badass shops, badass shows that it's at. You know what I mean? Yeah. It all kind of oh, yeah. goes into it's that race of, it's that race of gentlemen thing. Yeah, yeah. How they really, really decorate all the backdrops well as they all the banners look like they were made in the forties mm-hmm. and do the whole thing up, you know? It's what makes it super cool. Well, I think that's why people want to do it because like that's their, not everybody gets to go to born free. Not everybody gets to go to the congregation. Not everybody gets to be a part of the race of gentlemen. So right. some of us have to live vicariously through the follows that we have on social media. Yeah. And so how we are viewing these things 
is how we dictate what how cool or not cool they are in our heads. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? And everybody gets to replicate that in their garage and take that motorcycle ride like yep. we're talking about with the Danny Lyon photo. Exactly. That, you know, makes you feel good about yourself. Especially when you put months of hard work into something, saving up, having your motor built, finding the right front end, picking all the right components. That's that's part of the big thing about it. That's, yeah, man. That's what customizing your own bike is, you know, it, that's it, you know. It's the next tattoo. <laughs> right. <laughs> when you run out of space, you just start on your bike. Right, right. Man, I love it, man. So, yeah, like uh, – this bike build though i mean like the 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 pan head that you you know how was the whole other than like obviously the shortcomings of like the way it was dealt with like one thing you were talking about in the car right over here that i really liked and i've been dealing with too is like you said it pushed you to do something you didn't know you were capable of realistically you know like or did you know you were capable of it? I, no. I think i said that no yeah. no no well um you kind of start realizing what you stepped in yeah you know what i mean because my involvement with that came from uh jared barnes uh apprenticed with me for a year uh -huh. and uh i like jerry's great dude we had a lot of good times together and messed stuff up together and learned stuff and yeah. he he talked me into doing it he said hey man um dude i know you're trying to be private and i know you're not really like that and whatever but dude you should you should enter this thing and yeah you ain't gonna make it too far in it or whatever it is what it is but it'll be good promotion for the business and you know it'll get you you know get the name out there and stuff so i entered my pan head as like a restoration bobber yeah it was not supposed to even look anything like it did and the motor i had had was about half put back together i had it built that bar that bike was a barn find Mm -hmm. that I found. I had to buy two shovel heads and that bike to get that bike. But it's a 51, and we built 51 cars. Yeah. So I was like, oh, I got to do this, you know? So anyway, that project was sitting there with a knucklehead front end, wheels that uh, period correct hubs and all that stuff. I laced wheels up to, you know, I was just going to, as as you do, you got your little project yeah. that you keep picking at for however long and then all of a sudden it's time to kind of get it together that's what that project was so i did my submission and i was like well we'll see how this goes i came home and i told my wife and i was like hey you know listen enter this thing i'm not going to california you know nothing will ever happen but i just want to let you know what's going on before you see a bunch of crazy stuff going on, on social media yeah so i make the cut to 25 because 25 13 6 so I made the cut to 25. I was like, oh, crap. You know, and then you start thinking about it a little bit. Start thinking about it a little bit. And I'm like, well, if I was an invited builder, I would have absolutely have built that bike mm -hmm. the way I was going to build it, which would have been a more blacked out bike. Um, I was going to do the motor more of a flat and nickel finish. Mm -hmm. Just a real military kind of look, real... Is that more your style, you would say? Because that's kind of how the Folsom bike is. A little bit more... No, those, those are just monochromatic kind of thing i mean i, I like them like that a lot but yeah. it's also um you can do it a little more economical like that you can sure, paint the whole yeah. frame you can paint the whole front end you know as opposed to chroming everything mm -hmm. so i can't remember whether it was the cut to 13 or after i got to 13 that i was like man i want to do this mm. i'm in we're jumping all the way in and then i realized crap i gotta chrome this bike out i gotta make a really flashy bike because now we're in show bike world you know what i mean yeah and in the process of doing that i realized that i had really screwed myself with that platform of motorcycle i'm capable of doing frame modifications and making whatever kind of frame i needed to make for that to make it look of caliber of the people that were doing so much more to their bikes yeah so i i'm already a shoe in the con or not a shoe in the contest but i already got my you know, entry in the contest with the most basic platform that I kind of can't modify. Yeah. Looking back with the COVID postponements, I could have got a whole nother frame and kept changing the configuration. But at the time, we didn't think Born Free was going to get canceled. Mm. So complete makeover of the bike change. And then that was supposed to have stock. That frame was pristine. And having restored some frames, man, it had the gas tank mounts, sidecar loops, brake crossover. 
uh, didn't have the floorboard tabs. And I had already been to a swap meet, bought the floorboard tabs from some guy that made real nice castings. That bike was going to be a restoration that I rode around as a bobber. And someday when I get older, I was going to make it a real 51. Mm. I had the tanks, like I said, doing the gas tank restoration on them, the whole deal. And threw all those parts to the wayside and like, now what are we going to do? Yeah. And how are we going to make this better than, you know, like a Lee pedal for a foot clutch? That's just round stock. Yeah. You know, and I'd already been, having been up to the congregation show, they make a real nice foot clutch pedal. I'm like, well, the premise of the show, in my opinion, if you really want to get taken seriously, was build as much stuff as you possibly can. Yeah. So how am I going to take all of those common parts and work with different materials and change them up? So that's with like the foot controls with them being all stainless, you know, square stock sleeved for round stock to slide into it. So when you look at it, it's not just regular yeah. cookie cutter stuff. There's a lot more thought planned into them using the torsion springs. So there's no vis visible springs and all that stuff to re-engineer all those little subtleties that, you realize you have to do all that. Yeah. And mind you, you make all that stuff four times. Yeah. You know? I've heard the, I've heard stories about that where you're like, you know, what was Jesse James's like famous words? Like, you know, if it ain't right, no matter how many hours you got into it, start over. Yeah. Some shit like that. That's you know? well, back to what we were talking about, about the paint stuff, how you were held to a higher caliber of paint yeah. with the way things were competitive around here in Dallas for that time period. Well, same with there. You know yeah. where that thing's going. Yeah. And you know you don't want somebody like Max Schaff or Jason Ferez or, or whoever looking at your bike who's already kind of through channels might, might or might not hit you up saying, dude, it's going to be a cool bike. Yeah. Oh, cool. And so now you're expecting me to put something together cool. <laughs> like it better be cool. Like yeah. the foot controls I have about a week in each side. And you yeah. said like on, on Jason's podcast where you were really having to uh, – I mean, because you're running a full-time business still. Like, you're still, you know, painting bikes and, and doing repair work and working on other people's bikes, too. And, like, how did you find the time to fit in this project within the year? I mean, when did you start officially on the bike? Uh, I think we started December. December, yeah, because that's like when that. they start calling it, right? I think so. it was something like that. And so, I mean, yeah, I mean, you only have... Well, at that time you're kind of being realistic with yourself yeah. and you're going, well, okay, I'm going to fab a bunch of stuff up and see if I make the next cut. Like that exhaust was on the outside of the frame. I believe when I made the cut to the 13 mm -hmm. and I was like, Oh, well that's got to change. We got to do something crazy with it. So let's notch the oil tank and squeeze it in between the frame and the rear wheel, which isn't uncommon to see. Yeah. But I've only seen it once or twice other than mine where it goes through and past the sissy bar, mm -hmm. which I got so much design time and that stuff. But I mean, to answer your question at that point when it's on, I had to basically buy the shop yeah. for a, for a week or so. Cause most, most projects I like to, you know, from 6am till eight in the morning, I work about six to three every day from 6am 6 a, 6 to 8am. I work on personal projects, achievements, you know, goals you're trying to make some progress on, whether it's art or uh, welding aluminum or something you're yeah. having some issues with or fixing a problem. If you Man, made a that's, mistake, that's a perfect thing you said, because that's kind of the new thing that I've adopted uh, that I've been, you know, cause I've, I've, I felt like I've had shortcomings in like pinstriping and being mm -hmm. able to work with a, a pinstriping brush or, you know, name it, you know, computer program I'm trying to perfect for videos. Or right, whatever, right. Right. But I do know that if you just put hours in every day or put time in every day, even if it's like 30 minutes, it's like mm -hmm. working out. If I just did 30 minutes a day, maybe yeah. this would be gone. You know what I mean? I feel the same way. Yeah. <laughs> Wish I had your body. I feel like a chick now. <laughs> no, so if, weird. uh, so if, uh, but you know, like that daily thing, right? So, you know, we were talking about the, the, the new guy I'm hiring on. It's like, I got to teach him everything, mm -hmm. but I'm thinking like that now. I'm like, okay, man, it, I'm going to try to get him to where I am with certain things in months rather than the 10, 15 years it took me to get to here. Yeah. And maybe that is like every day something he has to sand and buff something. Mm -hmm. And then after two weeks, man, that 
he's he's pretty fluid with his buffer. Yeah. Same thing with like pinstriping. Man, if I just pulled a couple lines every day with a pinstripe brush. Yeah. If I just like had like a sheet that had like A B C D F G all the way to Z, and I just did that every day for mm -hmm. an hour, like you said. Yep. At at the end of two months, I'd be able to do that without. You yeah. know, without the, the the tracing or without those certain things, I'll have the muscle memory down yeah. to do an S. To well, do this. and it's it it was um, important for me to learn to not get discouraged if you don't have two hours one okay. morning, and you can only do a little bit, or maybe you skip a day, and it's hard to stay focused to keep doing it. But that's all those raffle tanks that I did to fund you know all the born free stuff um, and and the bike build stuff. That was planned art progression of taking things from a line drawing to how can I make this att how can I attempt to make this hold its own weight yeah. with whatever you know I, I started I think I was telling you after I uh, did the brush masters in 2018 you know they stress draw everything yeah don't copy nothing whatever and I realized I'm like man if I want to be taken seriously at some point in time when hopefully I'm good enough it's going to have to be this certain way and I transitioned to, uh, I had to learn, I got an iPad and had to learn the Procreate program mm -hmm. and how you can manipulate that, um, which is a very useful tool for, for uh, you know, uh, painting bikes for the, for the dealership. Yeah. And you do a consultation with a customer, you can pull up whatever kind of road glide, you can color that thing in. We get to my house later, I'll show you my setup on the iPad, yeah. how I do all my uh, templates for the bikes. Uh, yeah, it's uh, I use Adobe though. I use Draw. Yeah. It's, it's probably the same. Thing. It's pretty similar, but yeah. I think Draw is uh, is vector based, right? And right. I think Procreate may or may not be. I'm not sure. I, I have Procreate as well, but according to um, Chris, he has some kind of program where we can convert everything to a vector file. Okay. I don't I don't know exactly. So what that's it why is. I say like the vector file. So say you send me a tank, right? And it's an odd shape. It's not the same shape as like a traditional Sportster tank or Fat mm -hmm. Bob, whatever. So I'll take two, I'll take a profile and then I'll take a, I'll take a three quarter shot and a profile shot. And then I'll just outline them and I have the sketch so I can work on my lines, yeah. how they come across, uh, which, you know, as a painter, like that saves you a lot of time with tape, you know, like yeah. not having a ball of tape this fucking big. Sure. Trying to get, figure out what you're doing. You know, it, it, you know it doesn't get you... Uh, where I'm at with it, it won't get me exactly there to get a professional enough look, but you exercise a bunch of things you don't want to do. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I like about it. Sometimes if I get a line drawing down, like I love these graphics and I got these colors, but I don't know where to put the colors. Sometimes mm -hmm. as you're drawing the shit, like I'll be drawing on the, uh, you know, I'll be sketching the lines out for the graphics on the bike and I'll be like, Oh yeah, I'm seeing this all red down here. And then we're going to do with a blue pinstripe and a little bit of champagne right here. Fuck, this is going to be dope. I see it, but sometimes I'm like, I don't know, man, but I love these lines. Yeah. <laughs> and so yeah. then I'll just make a copy of all the lines and then I'll just sit there and, all right, let's try red here and this here. Huh? Well, just to be safe, let me swap them on this other sketch that mm -hmm. I just copy. And then I'm like, all right, yeah, my original idea is the one I wanted to go I with. I try it with your, your purple theory. Yeah. Whenever um, I did one of the raffle tanks that has purple pinstriping. Yeah. I knew I in my head I saw that that I wanted that purple with that it's uh, the paint huffer whatever the black uh, metal flake is the space gray no it's just all black okay but okay. it's it's I can't remember what the name of it is but it's that and it's Oriental blue flames mm. and I saw purple in my head and I went through a bunch of different things on the procreate how you can dial your color in yeah and it's the same color as some one shot. But I tried it in all the one shot colors I had. And you, know, you can take a photo of that, of your one shot can and hold your finger on it and drag it over to your color palette oh, you and can? throw those exact, that exact color line on it. That's cool. Yeah. And I found out none of them worked. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that the purple worked. Dude, but, you know. Some, you know, like, uh, like Jeremy, Lucky Strike, mm -hmm. we were talking about him. Uh, he has color, his color palette for his paint jobs. If you if you really dissect a lot of us, Boosted Brad, Jeremy, you, mm -hmm. I think guys like Poland, you know, he's mm -hmm. he just deals with so many different styles that it's hard to kind of categorize him and what sure, sure. really like his his paint jobs are colorful, right? So mm -hmm. is Jeremy's to be yeah. safe. Oh yeah, yeah. But 
there's certain things that you can tell in Jeremy's paint jobs that that's his like this is me yeah colors you yeah. know he uses cream a lot and mm -hmm. whites a lot and he does a really good job with those and it, it it when I see those colors even if like I'm not quite sure what the design is I'm like oh is that Jeremy over there yeah I use gray in everything mm -hmm. or silver or, or like that kind of off <coughs> you know like I like to tell people like my style is that late that that first thing you learn how to do in photoshop where you make a gray photo and then make the lips red right, right i like right. splashes of color it looks know? good man it pops i try <laughs> i'm trying to get i'm trying to get away from brown dude brown is dude i've had a hard time shooting brown i love it candy root beer is like one of the hard, hardest colors over like a silver base to just like make even silver. yeah i like it over gold gold that's probably a better yeah, better move. I, I love it over gold because then the tangerine blends. Yeah, because the House of Color root beer works off of all the beginning gradations mm -hmm. of tangerine, so you can you can drop it easier with yeah. with concentrate. You know, but yeah, man, the first bike that I got that ever had any magazine coverage mm -hmm. was a brown metal flake shovel head nothing special i don't even know why it was an american iron even though thank you for having it in there yeah appreciate it but it was just a basic brown and black with a cream pinstripe i had a dodge truck classic colors man that was it looked black but it was metal flake brown mm -hmm. my gmc truck i got right now is a it's called smoky quartz mm -hmm. so it's like an olive brown which i love that color it's almost yeah. like one of the blends you did with your champagne daddy on your bike. Okay, yeah. But it's the whole thing. But I'm about to paint Bo Crumb that did all the videos for us. Yeah. I'm painting his bike. He wants he wants the root beer brown and the and the so gold fades and stuff. I'm like, dude, you can't go wrong with it. But I but don't want to be. But that's also, that, that's you though. I mean, like. Yeah. I, I think that's the thing that sucks about all of us painters is that like, uh we get good at certain things and we don't want to be stuck with it. Like that's right. me. Like I don't want to be the gray guy, but I'm fucking good at gray, man. <laughs> yeah. But how many, okay. How many variations from silver to Oriental blue to cobalt blue are you going to do? That's the, what's that, in between those to give you another. Well, color. think about it like this. Think about it. Like, so for the last three years, most of our work has been silver flake based and then built up in candies mm -hmm. from there. We silver flake, gives you the tone for the 12 candies that there are. Right. right. And that's it. Yeah. You have to figure out other ways to make these colors work. And whether that's using a metallic, like just a, you know, like sometimes we'll use galaxy gray, like a gray metallic. Mm -hmm. That's not as flaky as flake. And then you put candy red over silver and over that gray and you get two different, very nice versions of candy red. Yeah. So it contrasts well, but at the same time, it's like, you know, I, I, when I, when customers hit me up about doing helmets and they have like factory colors they want to work with, I have to kind of like, I have to be like, all right, I'm down, but you do realize that my helmets pop because of flake. Right. And your stuff does not have flake. Like I can't yeah. make what, what's like a pop that what's that lime green, like Mustang color that everybody was doing for a while. The, the, uh, the um the not no no metal flake color yeah it's just like a pearlish kind of yeah. very very fine metallic I, I know which one you're talking about i can't do that in flake dude no so if you want that color we can do it but it's it, it becomes like it's it's managing expe expectations what I, I always say like we're yeah. doing because they have you know they always say like i like this but i want this and it's like okay well i have to manage that expectation of like he wants this but this is not that and the metal flake gives you that expectation. Exactly, that metal sense. flake gives you that that, that pop, that that uh, yeah. that that dance, all that shit. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, and on a helmet, like you can get away, like a helmet or a chopper, mm -hmm. you can get away with some gaudy shit yeah. that you can't do on a car. No, you know what I mean. No, so mm -hmm. it's like you kind of. Fortunately, the couple that like that uh, iron head chopper of Chris Rosenberg's. Yeah, it's the one I did the uh, the goat head uh -huh. on the top, and it's mustard. Dude, mustard's hot right now. And he was like, "You got a mustard shirt on." <laughs> I do. He saw a Land Rover because uh -huh. there's a there's an auto body shop. Uh, Jason Martin's shop, Lucky Thirteen, is is next to me. So he had, he does some older um, cars restorations and stuff, and he does a lot of collision work. But there was a um, a Land Rover out there, and Chris came cruising by. He's like, "What do you think about that Land Rover cover?" And it was like, I don't know a lot about Land Rovers, uh, 
but I, I would imagine it's the 60s or 70s, and it's that mustard. So his paint is mustard with brown metal flake and black pinstripes. That's dope. Dude, I feel like I've been getting – you know how, like, uh, Google hits you with ads, right? Because you said, like, oh, I wanted a Land Rover, and then we open our phone. It'll be as soon as we open our phone. Exactly. So <laughs> when, when my buddy in 7 Kyle started saying mustard so hot right now thing that was going on the internet, then – I rode to New York for the first time, and me oh, and my yeah, buddy yeah. Steve were riding around New York, and all the license plates are those navy blue with those kind of mustard yellow oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, license plates. And I'm like, <coughs> fuck, dude, I love that. Yeah, It's kind of, it, it gives you like that, to me it gives me that, uh, you know like that old OD green that Harley used on the, on the early model yeah, bikes? Yeah. It's, uh, it's called... Well, there's a couple different greens. One's like a forest green, and then one's like an olive green. Yeah. I like that. You know, it, is that a knock? I don't know. Oh. Well, in this world of like like pop and paint and pearls and stuff, sometimes that navy blue and mustard green just like, or, or mustard yellow, mm -hmm. just goes like, hey, man, I'm OG. I've been here forever. Right, and right. I work. You yeah. know what I mean? So, like, I've been uh, incorporating like yellow like that version of yellow pinstripes into my work. And I've never used yellow in my life. Yeah. So it's like something that I'm like slowly dipping my toe in, but I, I dig it. Cause like none of us want a yellow Corvette, right? Nobody wants a yellow. Yeah. Corvette. Nobody wants a yellow anything, <laughs> but some there's certain versions of yellow where it's like, nah, bro, it's, it's gold. Right. Don't, right, don't right. yell at me. It's gold. Right. All right. Like your shirt. Like I'd say, Oh, that's gold. What's the, what's the uh, house of color base? That's not the gamma. Is it gamma gold? Gamma gold is one, yeah. And, and solar gold. The solar gold is a really weird gold. It's not a gold you opinion. spray bare. You have yeah, to Yeah, it can't hold its own. It. Yeah. I did a Triumph that I based the tank, and I did uh, candy apple red flames. Yeah. Maybe. No, I did candy apple red panels with gold pearl ghost flames. And the candy apple came out good, but I remember I was spraying that gold on. I was like, that's a weird gold, man. I hope this looks right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but I like that. Um, I like that, that Harley gold, the, the base for their, for their candies. Which like old school or newer school? Um, it's a metal flake base. So it's like a, almost a brownish gold. And it's mm. got tiny micro flake in it. I think I know what you're talking about. It, it. For like the hard candy, like the the ones they use for red and stuff like that mm -hmm. on sports tanks and mm -hmm. shit. I got it because I did a crazy uh, that crazy gold heavy flake mm -hmm. factory custom paint they did. It was left over from that, and I based some stuff on that. And I like that color a lot. Yeah, man, I've I've been I've been, you know, like colors color combinations really kind of uh, push my vibe real mm -hmm. hard. So when I first rebranded from Live Fast Customs to the Fast Life Garage. Me and my grandfather were going down a C10 truck thing, and mm -hmm. this is like 2014. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, C10s 2014, you know, seafoam green. Like some seafoam green. The baby blue color, like those colors were really like speaking to me. So, like, when I, the first time I rebranded and re logoed this thing I got here, I was using turquoise and purple. Mm -hmm. uh, so like that white bike I was showing you on the wall down there. Oh, right, right, right. Turquoise right. and purple pinstripes mm -hmm. on there. Um, and then that kind of evolved into uh, purple always stuck from there on yeah, out. Yeah, right. Um, but then I go through phases where like certain color combinations really kind of dictate my, this era or this uh, generation of my generation of painting or whatever the fuck mm -hmm. I would say. That doesn't make any sense. But, no, it does. You know. it, well, for a time period. Yeah, time I, period. I want to try... Um, my 83 FXR uh, is that new Toyota Tacoma blue mm -hmm. and ox blood. And then I did variegated leaf flames over all of it. And I did ox blood traditional FXR panels mm -hmm. on it. And I want to do like a variation of that, but a little more extreme mm -hmm. with maybe a brandy wine candy. And some different color, like just crazy blue. Do you ever like do like test panels for any of these type of like? Man, I was doing really good for a while, mm -hmm. and I need to get back on it. I always used to shoot a test panel for customers when we were doing a super crazy paint job, 
And if the test panel didn't get too butchered in the bad idea department, yeah, I would dress it up and do like on the corners of the panel and do like an alleyway thing on it and sign it. And, you know, they'd have, they put it on their mantle or whatever yeah, they yeah. do with it, you know? Um, but it depends on how hard I'm experimenting. If I really need to make sure some stuff goes right, like with all that crack paint stuff. Yeah, I was going to ask you off the air that that stuff is like, I want to learn how to do it, but I don't want to do it. Like, I don't think I can incorporate it in my work, but we, I hate not knowing how to do something. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about it, but that, that stuff is very hard to manipulate mm -hmm. um, as far as making it do what you want to do. And the variations of colors are very strange. And I experimented with tinting over some of the colors in contrast where you, you dirty it up so much in the process. Yeah. The cream on Mike Wilson's knucklehead was a standard vivid white before that process happened. Mm. So Is you're it like a fire thing that you're burning it? No. Nah. <laughs> you can tell me later. Yeah. I'll tell you later. I was told to hold on to that one by a couple of people. So um, Dude, you know when the when the leaf resurgence came up, like maybe four years ago when everybody started like getting to where leafing became very predominant in, in our industry. Mm -hmm. It's always been around, but when it was just like, yo, like everybody's doing it now, it was like that too. Like nobody wanted to share the secrets and yeah. stuff. And then of course somebody's like, fuck it, I'm going to do a YouTube video on it. <laughs> it's right. like, right. right now everybody can do it. It's still like the conversation me and you were having. Yeah. The first thing I asked Jeremy when I saw him in Daytona at the V twin visionary show. Yeah. And Jeremy was one of the instructors at Brush Masters, mm -hmm. was very nice enough to not know me from Adam and give me a ride to the airport at 4.30 or something crazy in the morning to the point that I was like, is this dude going to show up? <laughs> we only talked for a second. He's a good dude. You know, yeah. I, you know, he definitely is an absolute great dude. I love Jeremy, yeah. you know, but uh, picks me up and uh, we're riding to the airport. And I bought him some Dunkin' Donuts. He gave me a quick pinstriping lesson <laughs> on some <laughs> some fundamentals that I yeah. should have already known. But we were talking about leafing then, and I still, with a lot of experimenting, still was picking his brain in yeah. Daytona about engine turning and leaf application and all that stuff that we were talking about. It's still it's an ongoing. It's so it's, tricky. It's one of those like things like you were saying about the morning, like getting in at six o'clock, and you know if you just start doing a couple of little lines, not, not the white yeah, ones, but the, right. <laughs> if you do a couple of those lines every morning, just like clockwork, then you, you understand the process better. Yeah. And, uh, I sucked at gold leaf to this year. My goal of, of 2020 was to get down the gold leaf. Yeah. Like consistently, like I could get away with it. Like every once in a while, like, ah, I fucked it up here. I fucked it up there, but I can fix it and it'll work. But consistently, like I know I can leave gold leaf this whole bike one time and I'm a walk away and it's fucking good. I, it took I, me a while. I did a paint job um, about that time period when I told you my friend Chad Martell and I were doing the Eastern FXR and Dyna mm -hmm. company. He was taking a bike to Sturgis and I was like, man, this has got to be the best paint job I know how to do. And I did it's the craziest paint job I could possibly do. And I did three quarter inch engine turned silver leaf pinstriping around or a panel around yeah. all, all the panels. It was subpar, you know, the pinstriping looked okay. Good thing about Instagram though, is they still look like spins. <laughs> However, <laughs> he turned out he didn't want colors on his bike anymore. He's like, man, I just, I'm a blacked out guy. I'm like, dude, you're killing me. Yeah. Are you serious? Like I, I, I tried as hard as I could on this paint job. Anyway, we did some swapping around. Dude drove all the way. I don't know what part of Texas. And the guy was super nice. He drove there to buy the bike and did not buy it because my engine turning was not Seriously? up to par. Oh, I was man, like, sucks. I'm like, bro, I hooked you up and did a bro deal on that paint job, first of all. And secondly, you took the pictures. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I don't know. I never claimed that it was whatever, yeah. but it, it is one of those deal breakers. Either it's good or it's not. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And uh, That's what's crazy about doing all that stuff, man. It's like, uh, you know... I've I've done things over the past that, that I'm super not proud of and you do, you know what perfect example so uh big troubles bike yeah the dyna that he mm -hmm. had in the show 
I hadn't seen that bike since it left, and something happened to the leaf while while I was in their position. Damn. It wasn't really? it wasn't something they did. Something that I did ended up reacting differently, and it discolored the leaf on the fender. Wow! And I didn't notice it uh, until I was there in person, and I saw it. I was like, "Fuck!" I was hmm. like, "Dude, you got to send me this fender right now!" Like, first off, it's like my most liked paint job ever. It's the most it's simple thing I've ever job. done, but. The leaf is fucked up. And I'm like, I got to fix that. You know what I mean? Like, quick. Yeah. You know? And he yeah. still hasn't sent me the fender. So if you're listening, motherfucker, <laughs> send me the goddamn fender, Mark. <laughs> right. But right. no, it's like, it's it's scary because, like, that is one of my more liked paint jobs. And I don't want people, I don't mind that they know that something got fucked up. I don't mind that because it happens. But I do want to fix it. Yeah. As soon as possible. Because I don't know what happened. And that's another thing. I thought it was like, because it was on the front fender, it was a carbon fender. I wow. thought maybe the tire rubbed it because it's kind of in the, the area of the tire where it would be like right mm -hmm. here where the leaf is. Yeah. So I thought maybe it was rubbing and it just burned it, which could yeah. cause some problems with right, the, right, the leaf. Right. But I was like, ah, uh, I don't know, man. Something isn't right here. I always question the size adhesion exactly. to a certain extent. It didn't come you know loose. I mean? It just, it almost absorbed all the reflectiveness of the... Uh, of the of the, the the leaf you know every every time i'm sure you've done a million times that you clear coat over some leaf and then you have some of it lift from under you know what the, the you know what the you know what the lifting is it's leaf laying on top of leaf yeah i'll show you how to take care of that either way it, it's not good and i'm always <laughs> like man this is a big patch of leaf <laughs> you know like, and you I can't sure tape over it right i sure it hope out. it's stuck yeah. really good yeah. It's such a it's such a finicky process, man. It it's uh it looks so good because it's like it's it's something that we can't it, it gives the the idea of like a chrome or anodizing or something, yeah. even though it's not quite as shiny as that, mm -hmm. but it's way shinier it, or reflective than we can make with paint. It's very significant to being done correctly and you can see it when it's a little off. If yeah. you well we can. <laughs> yeah, we you can. Know. The worst part is like when you got dudes that you know because when you test the leaf, you like you'll you'll you're supposed to drag your finger across the mm -hmm. this glue. Some dudes just stick their thumb in it and they okay. got their fingerprints all awesome. over it. And then you <laughs> stick the leaf down and you see their fingerprints through the leaf. I'm like, man, all right, man. I put the when I was at Brush Masters and uh, Masa from Center Roots yeah. was coaching me through it. I laid it on way too heavy, which was a weird thing. The, be, the beginning of that whole interaction, they, they moved some people up to the front table. They were like, hey, clearly some people here know what's going on. Some people don't. So we're going to select some people and you need to come up here and sit at the table and you can kind of move forward. And uh, so I think his name's Pedro. He goes by El Bombo on Instagram. I had just met him that morning. He's sitting a person over from me. I had met Boosted Brad at that event. He's sitting, no, he was sitting to my right or left, and then um, Homer Sands. Mm -hmm. is, I'm in between all of them. And we start, like, you guys, the guys that know what they're doing. I'm looking around going, these guys do, <laughs> yeah. you know. But uh, I was hard-pressed on, on, like, I really like uh, Masa's work and stuff, yeah. you know. So I, I laid. His style is very unique. You know what I mean? Man, Center Roots on yeah. Instagram. If y'all haven't followed that dude, he's uh He's the man. He's setting trims. Same thing with the Kings custom out there or something. Mm -hmm. There's a couple dudes out of Japan, Thailand area. Yeah. Not that they're like close, but you know right. in that, that in, world. A, in my mind, I feel like they are oh, sometimes. Like, dude, like they can fucking <laughs> right around the corner. It's just like, take a bicycle ride. It's like Jacksonville <laughs> to the fucking uh South Carolina. <laughs> right. Yeah, and and Masa engraves and yeah. and does blown glass. Uh, you know, glass leafing for shop signs, mm -hmm. everything, you know, but anyway, uh, and what he told me that day kind of resonated through, um, definitely when I was apprenticing Jared on, uh, you know, we were waiting on the size to dry. I'm like, so what about now? Can we lay it down? What about now? He's like, nah, we wait. <laughs> I'm like, all right, we're like 45, 50 minutes deep into it. Yeah. And, you know, and he would keep saying, like, when he was showing me how to do some pinstriping exercise, and I'd get about five of them right and come back, and I was so proud of him. He's like, oh, very nice. But again, you do again. I'm like, oh, awesome. I still suck. <laughs> you know? 
He's got that uh, that Mr. Miyagi wisdom. Yeah, man. You know, uh, yeah. one thing about uh, Center Roots, Center Roots, uh, and, and his work, he did this uh, serious pride bagger a couple years ago. It was like that kind of mm-hmm. turquoisey uh, Oriental blue. Well, he did. Uh, uh, mind you, this is my early days of uh, panel work. You right. know, when I first kind of right. started it, and uh, he had made this like fish scale that was kind of like an exotic fish scale is what it was. Yeah, and so. I dissected it through Instagram and I recreated it on my FXR. Oh, you can see in the right, top. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. And you know, one thing that I've always done, and I, hopefully this works for the people that I, I learn tricks from, but I always get online and when I post it, I'm like, check out this new trick that I learned from so and so. It's the right thing to do. Yeah. And you know, like, I mean, I do it every once in a while now. You know what I mean? It's a really nice design that kind of, you know, helps kill space basically. Mm-hmm. But yeah. You know, I just, the dude, he was the first one to ever do it. I copied him, and I love it, and I got it from him, and that's how that's supposed to work. <laughs> you you wouldn't believe so many um, innovative ideas that me and um, Brad spent some time with him. Yeah. Um, just really, nobody really knew who he was there it's crazy so no much. Knows, yeah. I mean, some people did, some people didn't, you know, but we, we harassed the crap out of him. Thank God he put up with us, you know, but he showed us how his brushes are made and you know we picked his brain about well you know we saw this on your instagram page how'd you do this and he's digging in his phone showing us his personal videos of his trial and error processes and sharing that with us he put up a if you put up a video like an actual series that you had to pay to subscribe to i'd Mm -hmm. do it yeah just for the just for the I don't really need physical instructions. If I see you do one thing, especially paint related, right? If I see you do it, I can do it. Yeah, not to your level, but I can. Uh, sure, I can attempt it and sure. probably get some kind of results. You out get of the it. gist of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he does that too with that uh, where he puts all that like more opal leaf down, and then he'll come back and put the some variegated? kind of. No, it's like a different leaf. I don't know what the word is, uh, but he'll come back with like this solution that he puts on there and then he'll airbrush around it wipe it off come back and do another brush stroke of it and it creates this like it's like a swirly it's it, I, I wanted to say it was like an opal kind of style but it, I don't think that's the word it is uh, but it's really nice looking um, they put him up there to at the beginning of I think it was like the first day each instructor had their you know, there's a series of instructors doing their classes and people were going up to a, a board and drawing freehand and there was a guy from up there somewhere who was an engineer. He was a Japanese dude. I forget his name, but he was super talented and badass. But he kind of stepped in to be interpreter. And uh, when Masa got up there to draw, he he drew a skull freehand. And, you know, they did the yeah the uh, to proportion of which way the skull's looking and everything. Yeah. And, and uh, man, you'd hear a pin drop in that room. And it was, you know everybody all the instructors everybody just sitting there waiting to see him make some magic and it was awesome i got video of it that's cool it's really cool you know but that the guy was like he knows every angle of the skull he doesn't need reference to i know know what you mean by i mean like maybe not so much now but you know 10 years ago dude i could do a skull any way you want you want yeah like i just knew and plus like many people started doing whenever realism starting to take over from fantasy skulls. Right. Like we all had a little skull that we had that we could take mm-hmm. pictures. And then yeah. if you turn the lights out and you flash a light, it makes it more dramatic. Right. And right. then you, you know, recreate that. So like, yeah, I mean the skull thing, I, in a way I miss it and I wish I did it more because I'm good at it. But at the same time, it's like, it doesn't have the same impact when people see a really, really good airbrush skull or even a pinstripe skull as they do when they see like Kenny Powers on a helmet. Right. When people see, oh, fuck, I love that show, you know? <coughs> fuck well, that noise. <laughs> well, that, that, the, the portraits that you do are, you know, I mean, they, yeah. they ain't a lot of people can throw it out there like that. It's pretty impressive. I appreciate that. It's a, uh, it's, it's, it's a weird thing to like have, but, it's a it's a love hate relationship because yeah. it brings me the most anxiety of everything I do in the paint shop. Yeah, because I don't do it every day, and so like I know it's in there. I know something. I know I can produce something every once in a while, but man, you just don't know. I don't know too many tattooers that are comfortable with portraits. 
Most well, of them are like, eh, I do yeah. them. But, eh. the tattooing is like, you can't erase. Like, right. I can start over. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, right. Um, no, the it's it's a very – Jeremy said it best a long time ago on the podcast. He goes, it's a it's a, it's an emotional roller coaster. Mm-hmm. You're very nervous when you're starting out a portrait on, on a helmet because more than anything, you want it to look like – the person you're trying to create right, right. and based on how much detail in your reference photo is about it, basically it's giving you how much things you can copy that give it the things it needs to become that person right sure so like uh this helmet i just posted it yesterday i had to end up doing this guy's tattoo which was a cross with his dad's initials his dad passed away uh in the 90s right and they had like no real good photos of him and I tried, man. I tried to enhance the photo on on Photoshop. Right. I tried to bring detail out, but it was just it was just so flat. There was no you know dynamic range in the photo to mm-hmm. pull any shadows or highlights out. And I was like, man, I can I can give a wing at it, but I know that when I send you this picture, when you look at this printed picture right here, this blown up and pixelated, you can see what it is. You, you oh, that's your dad, right? But when I'm airbrushing that, and I can't see where his eyelid starts. And stops yeah. and his eyebrow starts and his nostrils stop from here to his cheeks like right it it's going to be affected on the image and it's not going to look like him and i'm going to do you a you know a, a real bad disservice and that's what happens yeah. with a lot of photos uh any kind of photography from before digital photos and now yeah. unless it was like like i did a muhammad ali once but he had professional photos done so there's high res images of that Right. Versus right, right. like all those badass TV shows from the from back in the day, especially the nineties, when they didn't have good quality cameras to yeah. take pictures of shit. So yeah. my Samuel Jackson's based on someone else's painting. That's not even the picture of him in the movie. Yeah. Because I couldn't find a good picture of him to blow up. Right. You know how right, bad right. I want a fucking Rick James Dave Chappelle helmet? <laughs> yeah, that's I want good. one really fucking bad. Yeah. To the point where I almost was gonna pay someone that's better at it. At, at, <laughs> right. you know like a steve gibson or something yeah, or even yeah. ryan townsend yeah those dudes are way they airbrush all the time so not not to say because they do that they're better but they're just they're practiced they're practiced so they can they can kind of interpret things that i can't because i don't do it every day or yeah. better yet they can they can interpret things that i can't because they're fucking better than me <laughs> you yeah. know i mean there's so much stuff in the art background exactly that the people that are that are um they're learned artists have they got the little tidbits yeah that that help out here and there you know like that's what my, the art that i started talking about that i transitioned to when, whenever my friend mike wilson comes in town yeah if i can plan out this didn't really happen through the panhead build when i was doing art projects in the morning when i had time and stuff like that yeah i'd be like hey uh can you pop in for a second because i got some stuff that looks kind of right mm-hmm. but He's like, right now he's showing me uh, where to put highlights. Yeah. Just a tiny bit of white here and there and different things that make it pop. And, um, you know, just trying to progress progression. Well, what's this thing? Cause you started talking about on Jason's podcast, this documentary that you and your friends were working on, they got put on, was it put on hold for COVID or the born free build? No, um, it was put on hold. Uh, we did a bunch of filming. Uh, and it's by a guy, Bo Crum, mm-hmm. that was a videographer for, uh, he was basically, Mike Peterson is from Jacksonville, Florida. He's a pro skater. Mm-hmm. Um, and Bo and Mike were very close friends. They were like the, you called them grommets when we were growing up. They're, they're younger skater kids, you know. And they grew up to become street skaters. And, um, Bo has obviously a lot of experience in videography and he wanted to do a documentary on a lot of guys that used to skateboard and got into Harley's, Mm -hmm. the Max Shafts. I mean, before Max Shaft, Jason, Jesse, you know, was very influential to myself and a lot of other people with the motorcycle stuff and, and, and music, uh, not only from people that played music, but types of music you listen to punk rock scene, how, listening to music as you create something can create a certain vibe and a mindset on, you know, I listen to Fu Manchu when I paint works for me. I don't know why. Yeah. You know what I mean? You know what I listen to is embarrassing. Who? I like chick music. Like, uh, oh, yeah. so I think I already said it before, but there's this uh, band called smoke season I don't and know. it's super 
poppy women singing. That's weird. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> hey, whatever works. I don't do it, it like it. It's kind of like background music. Not. Yeah. I mean, they're good tunes, in my opinion. Like good. It ain't shit that like if me and you're gonna leave here, I'm gonna throw in the car. <laughs> right, right. You know, it's like I'm not me and you're not gonna listen to Brian McKnight on the way to bike night tonight. Right, 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 right. <laughs> so, but no, go ahead. I'm sorry. Now the Fu Manchu, uh, I know my friend um, Brian um, that has uh, French Kiss, mm -hmm. the painter. He he told me he listens to Fu Manchu and Caius and stuff like that, like blues, metal, yeah. rock stuff. You know, but uh, anyway, um, the documentary. <laughs> Uh, we started filming right before um, the People's Champ thing, and we realized that getting through it, uh, we filmed a lot of stuff about what goes on around the shop and, mm -hmm. and you know, just working on, on stuff. And uh, we stopped because another story was developing in the middle of it. And if COVID would have never happened, Bo would have flown out to California and filmed me riding the bike in whatever capacity. Yeah. All that stuff would have happened. So um, we're finishing that up. Um, we did a little bit more filming, I think it was three weeks ago. We're gonna uh, do a little bit more riding footage and it just tells a story of, you know. Is it more than just you in there? Is there other people or is it kind of just following this, what you were doing? This particular one, it just covers like kind of my story. Mm -hmm. And um, we were debating on getting some other people to interview me because I know some of the uh, older East Coast pros. Yeah. Um, and we're, I think we're just gonna, we spent so much time filming where I think we're just gonna wrap it up. But I was, before COVID hit, we were originally gonna do a, um, a party that was gonna be like an art showcase. Mm. And I had it arranged um, where we were gonna air the documentary, some bands would play, my band would play, some other skater bands would play. And then I contacted some photography artists from all over the East Coast that were from my time period of when vert was popular on the east coast that took pictures and they were there was uh four or five that were going to showcase yeah, i think you just posted some recently yeah yeah, yeah. that was a, of a good friend of mine steve palmberg that used to live in jacksonville yeah. um and he's an artist and a photographer from atlanta and he was going to come down because he has photos of you know i was like well you only got so much space display as many as you want um but we we're going to basically do a photography art deal where like jim arbergast that takes a lot of photos for me and stuff that guy's been around i mm -hmm. mean he's got early acdc bon scott photos of them playing like at a, some dive bar in front yeah. of them and stuff like that and just let it let it be a real art uh, you know we can't really have skateboarding there but kind of let it be that kind of thing and and i apparently the way bo's going to do it is that i'll be the first of i think he's going to do one on mike peterson because mike rides mm -hmm. he's a dyna guy now nice and um you know kind of let it go from there and, and just you know evolve so where the where they was he plan to put them on like on youtube or is he going to like release them through like other channels we're gonna he's, he's trying to figure out the format right now because we were going to do a local release and then it was going to obviously be on alleyways got a youtube channel mm -hmm. and um share it somehow in, in a format like that where people can see it and man you know. i the for me man like like i said this whole year has been like the art that i want to put out is more the visual medium like yeah creating like short films documentary type stuff or whatever but it's like you start thinking of all these cool shots and ideas but then you're like all right but what am i going to say that was you the know? hard part about getting <laughs> um you know the interview process with a lot of that was trying there you're, you're being asked a question mm -hmm. about what gives you a feeling how a motorcycle feels to ride mm -hmm. you know whatever kind of you know obviously harley's with us but like we were talking about between the fxrs and an old bike and that same feeling about hauling ass yeah on a skateboard on a vert ramp at a skate park or down a you know You're bombing a hill or something yeah bombing a hill or whatever and that that same rush and how that all works in the same capacity as maybe the rush of playing music live on stage the yeah. you know that oh man shit's about to be crazy and then yeah. you you get through the first 
two songs as you're performing live and you're like, oh, and then you're in the zone. Maybe, yeah. you're, maybe you're in the same zone as when you're just like kind of zen riding your chopper and everything's purring just right Yeah. or, you know, whatever. But it's it was hard to, to describe that. <laughs> You, you know, but that's really that's kind something of, that you would have to you would have to say that a hundred times and write it a hundred ways, and then find the cliff note soundbite version of that that sounds really good out of your mouth that's short, yeah. sweet, and to the point. But everybody that's done yeah. one of all three of those things, including yourself, you're like or bombings, you know exactly what we're talking about. Yeah, exactly, and it's it's more something to, to bring out and showcase for all the like-minded people that will get the same thing that are already kind of doing it. Yeah. You know, we're just talking about it. You know, the one thing about skateboarding that, that I find the most relative to motorcycles for me is here in Dallas, like we have downtown Dallas, right? So what we used to do when I was a kid and I was one with the car is I would pick up all the other kids and we would go to downtown Dallas about 2 a.m., 3 a.m., right? Park the car and we used to have this spot on top of us, this rooftop. We used to call it the rooftop. And it was just like kind of soft, but still skatable. Mm -hmm. And so you could do gaps and rails and all this <coughs> shit. People would bring little, you know, parking things up there. And we just had a good time. But then there was marble ledges and stairs all over downtown Dallas. Yeah. And I just remember being there as kids, you know, skating this fucking ledge for three hours and the sun's coming up and people are showing up to go to work because it's Tuesday. <laughs> right, right. And, you know, it's just like you're in this world of like you're doing rad shit and you're, you know, you're you're a part of society, but it, not really. You well, know, it's what it feels like when you ride a bike, man. Like you. Another part of that is that was from the perspective of doing it solo. Mm. The other perspective is doing it with your friends. Yeah. So that's the same feeling of bombing that hill. Like in, in Jacksonville, we went street skating pre handrail yeah, and yeah. stuff like that. We go to all the parking garages downtown. Same thing we did. Yeah, oh, that's that's what I thought yeah. you were going to say about that. And you get chased down by the security guys and all this stuff. But we play games where we'd roll up on each other, taking the curves and try to pull each other's shoelaces and that's some road rash. You shit. know, like real Mad Max stuff. Yeah. But either way, the the camaraderie. And, and and the connection you were having with the same like-minded people transitions into riding in a pack of two I mean, people. Think about it. How, how awkward is it when someone wrecks, right? Like say you're skating and someone has a bad spill yeah. and you're just like, I mean, I don't know if I should call his mom I'm going <laughs> right. to and let him like, let him just walk this off. Like, right. should I go try and, is it my turn or are Hopefully you going to keep laying on the, on the rail <laughs> right. for the next 10 minutes? Like, right. what are we doing? You know, it's just Can awkward. Can you please move out of the way? All right, man, are you dead? <laughs> Did you break, is your leg broken? So no, I get it, man. But like, like, like I said that I, I remember one of the parking garages that we used to bomb down, we would, you know, cause the donut shops would open at like 4am or some shit. So we would go get like a couple glazed donuts take the elevator to the top. And that was kind of like the end of the night was that, because that's when the car started pulling up. Right. Uh, about, you know, we'd bomb at like 5.30. Yeah. Because there was no cars in there yet, but the sun was starting to peak over, you know, and you're on top of like a 12-story parking garage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The sun's coming up and you're sitting on the edge you know, just kind of recapping the night with your buddies and yeah. the crazy bum story you just heard of the security right. guard that fought you off. And you're kind of like, you know, you're just kind of, uh, you're, you're doing the opposite of society and you're so free. And that's what I feel like when I travel on my bike, when I'm mm -hmm. cruising through it, when I'm cruising through LA on Wednesday, you know, morning or afternoon or whatever. And I'm like, these people are all going to work yeah. and I'm on vacation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just like, that was the only connection that I really had other than the thrill of it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, yeah, it's a big connection between, you know, with, with playing music when you start that live set, mm -hmm. nobody understands that just the three or four of you or you by yourself, you're locked in to, you can't walk off. Yeah. You can't get out of there. So you're kind of forced to make this little thing that's going on, you know, that everybody calls the magic of playing and creating and making music, you know, that's going on and that, that bonds you you guys yeah, together yeah. big time you know and all the little quirks you know, the things that only you know is going on 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 stage the mistakes you make it's from just like when you whatever. go on a bike trip with your boys and all of a sudden you come back saying this saying you yeah. know what i mean because that became the the word of the trip you know right, I mean? right. oh yeah, yeah yeah the beer yeah. of the trip or whatever the right. case may be it's right. like you pick up all these little nuances 
basically different experiences, but that I don't think it's the same with uh, uh, maybe not high school sports. You know, maybe or maybe not, but there's different. There's a rebellious side with all the the skateboarding and and the, and the music. Yeah, high and school the sports. You know, to speak the on the fact that I actually played in some of it was more. You had teammates, but you were still always competitive against them too. Yeah, you know, it's like, you know, because when you're in high school, if you want to play sports, you want to get to the next level, which is college. So your goal is to outshine, right, the team, right. and it's a team effort, right? So it's yeah. kind of, I mean, you have to. You got it. It's it's a contradictory thing because you got to play with the team to help the team win, but you still got to shine above it yeah. to be picked for uh, college. Yeah. But yeah, I know what you mean. It's um, you know, Danny Danny G said it best in this podcast. You know, we were talking about you know he's Vans skateboard culture, mm-hmm. all this stuff growing up, punk rock. He goes, man, like these kind of kids just it became the family. It became that sports team. It became all this shit that that you know you know punk rocker kids and and heavy metal kids and all these other it wasn't popular to be those guys back then especially yeah. in the 90s for me at least no no what i mean when i became a sponsored amateur skateboarder mm-hmm. in jacksonville you sound Beach, like Florida, fucking bobby ricky bobby's dad right i know <laughs> i was like this is gonna be weird but um you know the this there were surf shops around there there was uh, aqua east surf shop sunrise surf shop dan yeah. brooks was the guy that helped everyone out and still does to this day. Sunrise is, is the shop in Jacksonville Beach. Um, but they had a surf team. When you're on the surf team, you got a gray sweatshirt. Yeah. Well, skateboarders in high school, there's probably five, six, under 10. Everybody hated us, mm. you know? Well, when I became a sponsored amateur with Sunrise, I got one of them sweatshirts for skating. Mm-hmm. And man, there's some people pissed pissed off and i rocked that shit i was a junior like the the surfer dudes were pissed or what a couple or of just... the surfer dudes were cool some of the surfer dudes wanted to keep it pure and they're like nah man and because they kind of the surfer guys were kind of down on some of the skater guys and we we're like well fuck y'all yeah you know and i was always like you're falling in water we're falling on concrete it's not even the same thing <laughs> yeah exactly. you know if you really want to get into it but I, I ain't bashing on you you're the one bashing on me whatever you know but it, w- it was very different with you know, skateboarding not being accepted coming up like that, you know, and, yeah. and uh, you know, how stoked are kids today to have some of the baddest parks you've ever seen. That's that's the weird thing about the progression of all these things that we hold dear to us now, motorcycles, skateboarding, yeah. music, like the shit that's played on them. I feel like I should have been my mom or my grandmother in the eighties, like, what are you listening to two live crew for? That's horrible. Right. Compared to what they say now. But at the same time, like, you know, riding motorcycles was always looked down upon like that. You were always a second class citizen. Yeah. Skateboarding the same thing, especially through the nineties when everything was about basically defacing public property. Right. You know what I mean? And then obviously music has always had its, you know, its fair share of, uh, getting told no from powers to be and shit. So, yeah, yeah. It's like we just keep picking the the wrong side of the tracks to hang out on, basically. Man, I like it over there. It's so much cooler. Yeah, <laughs> it's know? way better. I like it over there. Yeah, man. It's it's weird how that, but it's weird how now. It's not even weird. It's just it's funny how now everything is. It's part of culture. Like you can go to Walmart and buy a skate ramp. You know, a little a little wedge ramp and shit like that. It's yeah. like so accepted um, to the point where there's skateboard video games. There's you know, motorcycles all over the place. I mean, the dirt bike thing really helped bring, I think it helped bring motorcycles into the like parents' eyes to be acceptable for kids. I think so, man. And, and, you know, how stoked are you to, I mean, I think a lot of dudes jumping on dinas doing stunts have a lot of that motorcycle background from motocross and dirt bikes and stuff, you know? So man, they're stoked. That's killer. You know, how stoked is a kid that's 14 doing a 540 no pads and some crazy 14 foot deep, perfect bowl that their city paid for that they go get to skate for free. Yeah. Well, yeah. What, it, what it really ultimately does is now that there is a, you got the, you got the class of people that just made do with what they did and they created this, for lack of a better term, sport, right? This whole scene. 
And then now that it's become accepted, now the these newer generations can take this shit so much further yeah. than people ever imagined because of the acceptance and the uh, and the opportunities that have. I forget what trick I saw the other day on on some kind of Instagram share or something. Yeah, but it was the most ridiculous stuff, and I'm like, man, I would have never ever thought that was even possible holy crap that is one thing i will say that came out of 2020 that i really enjoy is i rediscovered skateboarding videos instead of watching political videos <laughs> right like right to see guys like you know for from my generation jamie thomas these guys that are 50 yeah. something years old now still out there fucking doing hard flips and kicking it downstairs and stuff like that yeah i'm like dang that's that's dope i love seeing that and then it's like you know, YouTube, right? So I'm on, I got my TVs everywhere. I watch YouTube all day, but it's like, man, like I can click on that COVID update for 2021 right. January, or right. I can watch what's Tom Penny doing now. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and watch a little, like what they're trying to do on you with this documentary about some of these skaters that I grew up idolizing. You know what yeah. I'm saying? It's way more better. It's way better, way more inspiring to watch that shit. Yeah. So, yeah, my friend Todd Johnson, that was one of my close friends, he was on the Sunrise team too. Mm -hmm. He goes by uh, Tojo Skates on Instagram. He's still killing vert with in Florida. There's, there's, I guess there's quite a few vert ramps and some of the old vert skaters. Mm -hmm. Mike Frazier was was a buddy of mine when I was a sponsored amateur. He went on to skate for Powell for you yeah. know pro and I know, and he's always posting videos. And my friend Todd is ripping still same tricks we were doing well better yeah you know and then sending me a video of him almost pulling off a frontside invert and he's two years older than me yeah <laughs> you know i'm like bro you're learning frontside inverts at 50 yeah. on a 14 foot like not a 10 foot vert ramp <laughs> yeah <laughs> <You know? watch> her. <laughs> like a, a gnarly vert ramp and he's still killing all the pools and stuff you know yeah it's awesome i wish that's one of the things that I think that what we, motorcycles, music, tattoos, all this stuff, I think one thing that I've noticed about about it, that, and this is a generalization, is that uh, I think that we don't ever stop dreaming. You know what I mean? I know yeah. that sounds kind of, you know, a human resources poster on the wall to be motivational, right, right. but like I'm almost 40 years old and I still got dreams like I'm fucking 20. Like, man, yeah. one day I'm going to do this and one day I'm going to do that. Yeah. And I think it's bred because our life is always fun. It's yeah. it's work. I it's agree. hard work. I agree. But it's still fucking rad, man, when you sit back and look at it. I hate yeah. this shot. But then whenever I'm, I'm going and I turn out those lights and I look back and I see that big logo LED up, I'm like, fuck, yeah, it's still badass. Yeah, man. Though. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Thanks, Carly. I, <laughs> right? Right? I feel the same way when I walk in the shop, no matter like, oh, today's going to suck. And I'm like... You know, man, I should be pretty thankful because I remember, you know, I'm sure it's the same way with you. I remember when that was a storage unit. Yeah. And I was cranking out, held that bike that was on, that was in American Iron, that basic shovel head. I painted that in a storage unit. Mm -hmm. My, my, that was my second shop because I got kicked out of one storage unit, commercial space. The second storage unit was a lift and a tabletop bench. And I covered everything in Visqueen, and I painted all those tins in the same place, and then yeah. cut and buffed them. And I'm like, man, I'm thankful to have it. <laughs> yeah, I got yeah. it. You know? Yeah, I mean, I've I've painted in some of the most crazy situations as well. But you know, like, uh, you know, there's there's never going to be a documentary about that shit. And the, you know what I mean? It's just it's just cool to know that you know when you're younger and you're and you're hungry to learn this shit then you'll do whatever it takes to kind of continue the process and that's yeah that's one of the things i notice about maybe some of the younger guys now is that it's always i need this and i need that before i can try this and try that and mm -hmm. i think that you know I didn't know there was better tools when I was young because I didn't have a YouTube or Instagram to, oh, I need yeah. that paint gun instead of the one that's cheap that I can afford. I just like, I mean, I, I'll make this work. You would have been lucky enough for somebody that actually paints to come by yeah. and hopefully tell you that you're doing it wrong. Yeah. And correct or what you. you used to have to do is like, if you didn't have like uh, any kind of painter friends, 
you would take it to the paint store you bought paint from <laughs> who these guys are not really that knowledgeable. I mean, they're knowledgeable on their products, but maybe not as knowledgeable on the application. Yeah. And you're like, Hey man, what did I do wrong here? And you just, and then hopefully some customer there is like, let me take a look at that. Here's yeah. what's going on. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah that was yeah. critiquing back in the day. It wasn't like, I'm gonna put it on Instagram and everybody's like, Oh man, it fucking sucks. That's a shitty layout. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, yeah. People bashing you that really you're going, man, I, I was just trying to get some advice. <laughs> Yeah, and that's the, that's the problem is that people, you know, for for instance, uh, I've been, I don't like Facebook, but I still have one, and I started getting, uh, becoming, I started getting on groups for like photography clicks in Dallas mm -hmm. to do like model shoots and stuff where you can like, like say you have a studio and you're like, hey man, I got this model coming in, we got lights, we got everything set up, if you want to come in and shoot with us and I'll show you some things yeah. it's a hundred dollars a spot i'm like fuck yeah i'll yeah, do that all day yeah, long yeah. even if i don't get to shoot i'll just watch right sure i want to see how he interacts with the model like how do you direct her because right. i don't know how to say those kind of things or, or do right, that right right but i forgot what i was gonna say <laughs> mm, it was going towards the uh photography and the and the oh and the that's right so uh, a lot of people I notice in those things will, will put photos up that are really good photos and they'll say, Hey, you guys are looking for some critiques. And it's like, I, in my head, I'm like, that's a great photo. I mean, yeah. I've, of my expertise, but right. then you look at people and you look at their cr criticism of it. And then you look at their work. And I'm like, are you even qualified to criticize their work? Facebook's horrible with that. Yeah. Stuff, it, but man. it's like this, First off, they shouldn't be asking people's opinions on a public forum. I was about to say that's asking you know, for maybe maybe you know find a photographer that you actually work with and they know you and you and just, and send them the photos. Say, hey man, check these out. Let me know what you think I could do differently. That yeah. way, it's not this. Hey, it's kind of like that. Hey, this is my bike. Uh, bash me. Hey, you, you like know? green or not? If you don't, please comment fifty times. Well, that's kind of the thing that sucks too about YouTube is that they all. I, I, once again, another point I got to make. <laughs> <laughs> After watching a year and a half of YouTube straight every day, I realized that it's part of their algorithm to get you, for them to grow their channel, to ask you to, to like, comment, and subscribe. Mm -hmm. So when you don't have anything to say, the comment becomes whatever you can think of first thing that comes to mind. Could be horrible, mean shit. Right. It could be awesome, that rocks. It could be a lot of stupid shit. But the point is, it's like you're you're encouraging people to put an opinion into something when it's really not necessary. You're just trying to get them to interact. Yeah. Because the interaction helps push their videos in the next thing, but it also inadvertently creates a lot of opinionated assholes that don't deserve to be putting their opinion out there. Yeah, man. Yeah. It dude, I see some stuff going on that, <laughs> you know, people put some stuff up for sale oh, on chopper swapper oh man there was a guy who put something up i think it was yesterday it was a solid pan head project mm -hmm. guy wanted 12 grand and there's a bunch of people chiming in bro you know i could get a running pan head for like a grand more like cool yeah do it why are you got to be bashing this dude he didn't say it's 18 grand yeah he said you could pretty much break that down i thought about it. i was like man if I had that money laying around, I could take what I need out of it, recoup the rest of it, probably make a couple bucks. I mean, it was that fair. Yeah. And then you sit back going, dude, what? Why? People just got to, they got to put their shit out there. in with some stuff. I, I tell people all the time, like, man, you, you shouldn't comment something that wouldn't get you punched in the face at a swap meet. It's the same principle. It's a swap yeah. meet on here. I don't know why you feel like you need to say something. Yeah. Walk up to <laughs> that know? dude with those prices and say that shit to him in his van. Well, you know yeah. what I mean? But yeah. it's the same thing with the FXR community. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you know, there's guys out there that, that put parts out there for really... It's hard to say. It's hard for me to say that it's an outrageous price, but it's because what it boils down to is, am I willing to pay that or not? If I'm not, I move on. My thing is, go find it. That yeah. dude did. Yeah. If he's been sitting on it for a while, he's probably been sitting on about 20 grand investment and in some stuff. So who are you to say what the price was when you weren't even around? Yeah. You don't know what he when you, you didn't even know what an FXR was. Exactly. So why are you chiming in and bashing this dude that played his cards right? Basically. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's ridiculous. Are we talking about the same dude, Elvis? <laughs> <laughs> no. 
I was He's I was dude. in the vintage world. I wasn't saying anything. You know what? I, I, I've always there's been a there was a there's a bike parts resale shop here in town. I don't know if they're still here, but they used to be back in my sport bike days. And everybody complained about their prices for used parts, but their prices were always half of what the part is brand new, right? But it was still like fuck, man. Like here's the deal: like you you do a wheelie on a bike, or you uh, right. your chain breaks and it smashes your water pump, and you got to buy a water pump for a fucking sport bike. Yeah. That's a very, very random item that you're never going to have to buy. Therefore, from the factory, it's seven, eight hundred dollars. Half of that is three hundred and fifty dollars, and people are like, "Fuck, three hundred fifty dollars for a water pump for a sport bike?" You know, it's like, well, it's still half of new. Yeah, and you're complaining like this dude's ripping you off when you can go buy it new for double that price. Yeah, man, it, it's you got to pay to play. You, you know. Or, or or have all the stuff stacked up. Yeah. Well, it's the same thing. It's the same concept because if, if that was a commonly broken item that gets broken a lot when people wreck, it would probably be cheaper because they'd have to mass produce more of those parts yeah. to yeah, fill yeah. the need. Therefore, it brings the price down. But we only have to make so many. Like, fuck, man, I can't afford to put these out there. Yeah. So. Yeah, man. It's a tough one. I don't know. So what do you, what, this year coming up, man, you got a. Uh, this year that we're in actually yeah it's so it's so it, weird i didn't fi- it didn't change it, <laughs> it feels the same it feels like 2020 drug on so long with yeah. so many bumps that uh yeah it is 2021 um so we're going to be around quite a few places um probably gonna, the biggest thing coming up for you guys is the show that you're hosting in daytona yeah um well, the show is at the adamac harley st augustine dealership which is 45 miles north of Ross the Myers. Ross Myers yeah. dealership on 95. Um, it's hosted by Cycle Source Magazine and Jason Hallman with the Garage Built Podcast. Mm-hmm. They'll be the host. Uh, we got a pro builder showcase. And we also have six categories. It's an open bike show. Uh, the pro builder showcase is a $1,000 purse for the winner. Nice. All six categories of the open bike show, which anyone's able to pull up and participate in. Um, so the open bike show allows it to be mainly choppers or is it open to different? It's six categories. Mm-hmm. So depending, we're going to modify this with attendance, mm-hmm. but the general premise is we'll have a chopper category. We'll have a best paint category. We'll have a best Dyna FXR category. We'll have a best performance bagger category. We'll have a best uh, vintage restoration category. Nice. And then we'll have an absolute open class that will be for bikes that are a little less customized, you know, to, uh, it is at a dealership. So there's plenty of people that put some handlebars and exhaust on their bike and are proud of it. And, 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 and we like to see that too, you know, that'll come out and they'll get, um, inspired by the bigger builds. Yeah. Well, the, the, the thing with this is that, um, and these builders are coming from all over the country. Uh, the, the pro builder list is bill Dodge. Boosted Brad, Brian Buteris, Drew from Freak Show Fab, Justin from Hang 'em High, Johnny Humphreys, Johnny Ninety Nine, uh, Rich will Rich with It'll Ride Choppers, mm-hmm. Kyle Ray Rice, um, the Copper Top Garage, Stephen Bates, which everybody knows him on Instagram as Dixiana. Uh, mm-hmm. He was in the People's Champ with me that had the Yamaha that got disqualified. He's bringing the Yamaha all the way from Alabama. <laughs> uh, Lefevre Cycles. Uh, Jared Weems that's doing the Triumph uh, Dave Mann restoration for Born Free. Yeah. Uh, Mad Pen Cycles, uh, Xavier with Providence Cycle Works. And we got a couple wild cards. Um, registration will be day of show. It's 10 bucks to get in. And uh, they'll have the Ives Brothers Wall of Death there nice. as well. And uh, Chris and Mark Adamac that own the Adamac dealerships are vintage bike guys. And uh, Chris Adamac has an extensive vintage bike Harley race bike mm-hmm. uh, collection. It's 30 something bikes. Oh, damn. Yeah, so we'll have those on display there. And uh, yeah, we're hoping to have a good time, man. The one year I decide I don't want to go to Daytona, you got to show there's a skinny tire bagger build off going on with the uh, hardcore cycles or performance baggers Instagram. Uh, then, of course, everybody in the performance bagger scene is going down there. And I, I think I'm going to go ride PCH during Daytona. Well, <laughs> you know, but um, I don't disagree, <laughs> but I think this is going to be dope. I think that, uh, you know, more shows like this coming out, that's, uh, 
it brings everybody together. That's one thing I loved about Born Free when they opened up to having San Diego Customs there yeah. to bring the Dinas and FXRs in and even Performance Baggers last year when we were there. Yeah. It's cool because we all party in the same fucking places. Like we're right. I might right. be on T bars and a bagger, but I feel closer to hanging out with you and your vintage chopper than I do with the the guy with the stereo and a big wheel and air ride. And, and we do as well because we're coming from the same backgrounds, just yeah. like what you're talking about, you know. And, and I hope that a bunch of FXRs and Dynas come out to, enough for right now. We're getting a ton of response from the chopper community, mm -hmm. um, you know, but we're hoping that enough FXR and Dyna and performance bagger people come out there where we can kind of fudge around those categories to, you know, kind of accommodate everybody. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so that's it, good. So you got that. And then, so we're basically going to be traveling almost every month yeah. up until August. So there's, uh, the chopper town bike show in Sarasota, Florida. That's I think February 19th to the 21st in Sarasota. Uh, bike week we're going to be down at the cycle source show we'll have francine the panhead down there uh i think we're going to be doing the v-twin visionary show wednesday mm -hmm. and then obviously we'll have our event saturday april uh we're participating in the congregation show um and that's kind of pending on what those guys are doing but we'll yeah. have a handful of bikes and be vending up there uh may we're an invited builder for bill dodge's Tennessee Motorcycle and Music Revival. Uh, June, we're headed to Born Free mm -hmm. to bring uh, our panhead out there. So are they going to, real quick, are they going to basically just carry on to Born Free? Would it be 11 or 12? I think it's 12, but I might be wrong. So um, so what what's going on with Born Free? And I don't want to speak out of turn uh, to represent them, um, but the gist as it's going on right now is all of the 29 invited builders got rolled over from 2020. The 2020 people's champ competitors, the final six, and I think all 25 that were in that year of competition will have a spot at Crook's corner and at born free. And then a whole nother 2021 people's champ competition starts. They just ended some uh, entry submissions for it. See, I feel like, Personally, which I'm not an expert, but I feel like if you just don't have it that year, then everything rolls over. And now Born Free 12 is Born Free 12, even if it isn't 2020. Unfortunately, yeah. the People's Champ thing's different from Born Free. Oh, okay, okay. And since it's Built Well stuff, um, but you know, the reason why Built Well's involved in that is for all the advertisement. Yeah. You know, amongst all the other things, and Built Well is very, very good to all of the People's Champ competitors. They hooked us up with parts. They promote the crap out of you yeah. if you choose to play that game. I mean, it has been a game changer for That's our good. business. Yeah. But uh, without being told directly, I, I'm assuming that that is, you know, you're under contract to hashtag them every time you're posting as frequently as you're supposed to. So, yeah. you know, they, they deserve it. That's what they're in it for. So, you know, that's why they have a whole nother batch of people that get to go through that torture in less time. So my hats are off to them because <laughs> they got six months to, to do it to it. And I've already seen some of the submissions. There's some people I'm pulling for mm -hmm. and, and there's already some phenomenal bikes coming together for it. So more power to those guys and looking forward to seeing them out there. You cool. know? What else? So after born free, then we're in July, you're pretty much chilling in July, chilling in July. And then in August, uh, hopefully will be our first trip to Sturgis. Nice. You know, so we're figuring out some stuff with that and, you know, I always feel like Sturgis is, that's Chris. That's New Year's Eve. It's Sturgis, and then right. after Sturgis, that's New Year's Day for me. Motorcycle related. And there's, related. you know, it, it's it's tough to. It's hard to plan after Sturgis, <laughs> right? You know, right? I mean? Well, you know, that's a it's a night and day travel schedule <laughs> from what we're used to. So, you know, we're looking forward to seeing everybody out there. You know, yeah. and and having them see, all, you know, all the stuff that we do, and, and uh, can't thank it enough all the people that with all the positive response to the people's champ bike and, you know, our social media blowing up and all the positive comments and, yeah. and, and stuff. It, it really has been overwhelming. And I, myself and everyone involved in Alley were very, very thankful for, for all the help. Uh, Jason Hallman and Chris and Heather from cycle source and yourself, Jason, you know, all the stuff that, man, it, it's great. To, you guys have made us feel very welcome. 
Dude, you build you cool know? shit, we'll sweat your nuts, man. That's yeah. how it works. Man, we really, really <laughs> appreciate it. No, it's it's a beautiful bike, man. Like I said, I walked up on it and didn't even, you know, uh, hadn't had much interaction of, of knowing you. And, you know, immediately the conversation we had at, at Jason's show there uh, was, you know, I walked away like, man, I, I told my wife, it's like, I could talk to that guy all day with a smile on my face. He just... It was a fun conversation, yeah. man. We were covering a lot of good <laughs> stuff. I am responsible for uh, in, in uh, winning the the Rick Hallman Legacy Award. Yeah, yeah. Um, down there, I I have some ideas that I'm gonna bounce off Jason. Um, you know, I, I'd like to see, given that that's kind of my responsibility this year, yeah, and I have to build the trophy. A, I have to create the trophy and, and pick the winner. Um, but I'd really like to encourage some people to. Uh, to build a bike for it, you know, short yeah. or long term, you got a whole year. Um, and I'd like to uh, give out the invitation that if you would like to direct message me about anything you would like to learn or better what you're trying to do to that motorcycle, yeah, to make it as top notch as it could be for that show, let's carry it on. You know, Jason was kind enough to plant the seed to give give us something that we can keep going. And I had a good time there. I think the placement of that of Jason's show being in December. At the beginning of December, right to kind of end our bike season, right of yeah. before we have to do the holiday shit. I had such a good time. It's great timing. You know what I mean? How it fell into place like that. It's an awesome show. Everybody there, you, you know, all the people that immediately from setup yeah. that Friday. You know, there's most of those builders. I, I didn't know. Yeah, and, and and I knew Jason would invite some some great people because he's like that. Yeah. You know. And, and that was a, an added plus when you got a bunch of builders around, which, you know, we've, we've kind of shadowed, uh, or whatever you want to call J Jason's event with, with inviting some of those builders to ours for bike week. But that's because all those people, you know, were super nice. That's the kind of people you want at your event. Yeah. They'll talk to the people that come up, you know, the attendees. They're not rock stars. They're professionals. Yeah, I mean they're rock stars in in general, but they're not acting like it. You know and I mean? and most a lot of them are very very accomplished. Well, well yeah. more accomplished than myself, you know. But you know they they all we all get along, and and it makes for a great event. And you know Jason did a great job putting you know putting that one yeah, on for sure. Well, cool man, we got to go to bike night. We do. Tell well, everybody where to find you on uh, Instagram and all those. The YouTube too, man, so I can check yeah, out the videos. Yeah. So on Instagram, it's Alleyway Customs with a K. Uh, we're actually on Facebook. And we also have a YouTube channel. The YouTube channel uh, is a series of, I believe it's 10 or 11 videos that document the build process of our People's Champ bike that mm -hmm. were shot real professionally by Bo at Bo Crumb Media. Um, so check that stuff out. We'll be adding to it. And, uh, you know. Give Jason's what's the what's the name listen. alleyway customs Alley, on, alleyway customs on YouTube, on YouTube. yep okay, cool. with a K with, with a K. K thank you for having me dude thanks for coming out man all right cool awesome. let's go yeah. let's go drink yo I hope you guys enjoyed that I had a great time hanging out with Fish we took him to bike night after this podcast and uh, really got to catch up with some more people here in the DFW area thank you for coming out man appreciate it if you're listening Fish. <laughs> Alleyway Customs, check him out. He built a beautiful bike. Had a great time with him, and uh, I'm stoked to uh, know the guy now. So if you're in Jacksonville, Florida, or in the Florida area, go check this guy out. He's an awesome human being. Also, we'll be back, man. We're coming back next week with Craig in the Down South Camp Out recap. We had a great time, man. This podcast is on YouTube now as we speak, and uh, I think it's pretty funny. I don't know. We, we tend to have a good time. Also on the podcast is uh, my good friend Dragon. It's going to be his uh, Fast Life podcast debut. You can catch him on some Cold Snack episodes on our Patreon if you want to check that out. And to be a patron supporter of this podcast, all it takes is a dollar a month. And you get the ability to check out the exclusive content that we release on Patreon only. Uh, a couple episodes. Uh, we just released one with uh, T-Bar Jesus, Mark from Texas Performance. And uh, the big homie, Steve Chamberlain. Uh, there's quite a few things on there. There's a couple other episodes from the past. Um, we do try to put extra content on there so that we can um, fund this podcast. All it takes is a dollar a month. Uh, but you can donate whatever you feel comfortable with drafting your out of your account monthly. It's a very safe thing. It's, you know, I've had people 
supporting this podcast for three years now on that on the Patreon. And I want to thank you guys the most because you really helped keep this thing rolling. So if you want to do it, head on over to the Fast Life. Oh, fuck, I messed it up. FastLifeGarage.com. And on the front page, there is a link to the Patreon. And uh, yeah, you can check all that shit out there. Like I said, we'll be back next week. Hope you guys have a great second week of January. Is it the second week? I think it is the second. Yeah. We'll be back next week. You guys rock on. Peace.